In 2012, Crack.com made a video about how all of the Pixar movies are secretly about the apocalypse. This video sparked a conspiracy that has been circling around the internet for the past year, and it's called The Pixar Theory. The Pixar Theory states that all of the Pixar movies exist within the same universe, and that both AI technology and animals grow a hatred towards humans because of their destructive actions. And all of this ultimately causes the apocalypse. We'll start with Brave. Supposedly, the reason animals and other Pixar films have human-like characteristics is because the witch from Brave has been experimenting on them. You know, like Mordu and Merida's mother. So the magic is provided by a witch who mysteriously vanishes every time she goes through a door. Does this sound familiar? Anyway, animals affected by the witch begin to interbreed, creating a large-scale population of animals that are slowly gaining personification and intelligence on their own. I'm on board so far. In Ratatouille, we see these animals further testing their abilities in small, controlled experiments. You know, by controlling a person like a giant meat marionette and cooking for a gourmet restaurant in Paris. So at the end of Ratatouille, everything turns out A-OK -okay for Remy and his friends, but what happens to Chef Skinner? He was the ultimate conspirator, so what did he do with this newfound knowledge that animals were transcending their natural instincts and performing human duties? better than humans. Well, I guess this takes us to Up. Charles Muntz hears of Chef Skinner's theories and gets the idea to begin inventing translator collars to interpret the thoughts of his dogs. And then Muntz uses this technology to find the exotic bird he's been obsessed with. Humans mistreating animals. Check. Finding Nemo also shows how animals have gained intelligence and personification and how humans mistreat animals. You know, like when the dentist steals Nemo from his natural habitat, makes him live in a tank with other captured animals, and almost gives him to a demonic child. Eh. Back to Up. At the beginning of the film, Carl Fredrickson is forced to move out of his house because of a large corporation. And if you remember, b and is a company that ended up polluting the earth and WALL-E. WALL-E is essentially a movie about how humans are terrible, but specifically how easily we give into technology. Well, where have we seen out of control AI technology before? Oh right, The Incredibles. Syndrome uses a similar advanced technology to create what is essentially a superhero genocide. And you thought Pixar made charming family films. Syndrome creates the Omnidroid, an AI kill bot that learns the move of every superhuman and adapts. When Mr. Incredible is first introduced to the machine, Mirage mentions that the technology has gained too much intelligence and is now rogue. Hmm, everything seems to be fitting in quite nicely, but you're probably thinking, where does Toy Story come in? Well, according to the theory, throughout the Toy Story trilogy, these toys are getting used and discarded by their owners. This, of course, is no problem for our heroes, but other toys like Lotso and the Prospector seek revenge. I guess sentient toys are somehow considered AI technology that humans are abusing and some have chosen to rebel. Eh. We then arrive at cars. That's a car pun. So technology rises and the industrial revolution has created too much pollution, which makes the earth unfit for humans, another reason why they had to leave in WALL-E. During the credits of WALL-E, the humans return to Earth and begin restoring the environment. This is supposedly where a bug's life fits in. Which means WALL-E's cockroach and flick could have possibly been friends? I'm just trying to find some positivity here. Fine, okay, last but definitely not least is Monsters, Inc. So while the humans were orbiting Earth in WALL-E, a new species was born. A species that goes to college and creates energy companies. You guessed it, monsters. So, the monsters have an energy crisis which is supplied by humans via what the theory says are time traveling doors. Yeah, okay, but what about Boo? She remembers the doors are the key to how she found Sully in the first place. And in an attempt to find him again, she starts traveling through these doors and begins creating animals with human-like characteristics when she can't find him. And I guess this can all be proved with the Sully wood carving found in the witch's cabin. The Pixar theory has a pretty rough timeline. There's no real chronological order. So to start debunking the Pixar theory, here's my opinion of the Pixar movie timeline. Brave comes first because it takes place in the Dark Ages. The Incredibles takes place in the 1960s, but in an alternate universe. And this has been confirmed by director Brad Bird. Toy Story 1 and 2 take place in modern day, which we can consider 1995 and 1999. Toy Story 3 is also modern day, but it's about 11 years after Toy Story 2, so this is about 2010. Some claim to have seen Boo in daycare with Bonnie, so Toy Story 3 and Monsters, Inc. must have happened around the same time. But it has been confirmed by director Leon Critch that this wasn't Boo. Up 
is in modern day. There were some theories that this had to take place after Toy Story 3 because you can see a postcard from Carl and Ellie in Andy's room. But this could be from years ago because Carl and Ellie were definitely kids around the 1930s and 40s, so it can't be much later than Toy Story 3. Ratatouille, modern day Paris. Finding Nemo, modern day Australia. Wally is in the distant future. But clues in the movie tell us that it takes place in 2805. Cars is an entirely different universe. Monsters Inc. could be happening in the future, but I always believe it took place in modern times just in an alternate universe because they never specifically time travel in the movie. So let's start to break this theory down by its own timeline. Brave and Ratatouille? Makes sense. It's possible that the witch improved her skills enough so that these human-animal hybrids didn't regress into their animal states like what happened with Mordu and Merida's mother. It's also possible that Charles Muntz had heard of Chef Skinner's series because Muntz is well-traveled and we're unsure of how long exactly he's been testing on these dogs. Finding Nemo is the one that doesn't really fit in. It makes sense that the animals dislike the humans because they're disturbing their environment. But even though the fish talk to birds, they never communicate with humans. So this can prove the theory that animals are becoming more intelligent than humans. And Toy Story is so haphazardly wedged in the theory that I'm not even going to delve into it. So the theory is all plausible again until cars. The theory just doesn't specify where these cars came from or how they live. What I thought was maybe while the humans were still on Earth, they began experimenting with this AI technology in cars. And maybe when they left, the cars evolved? But the humans and Wally were only gone 800 years, which is not enough time for an entire car species to evolve, live, and then completely disappear along with the monster's ink species. So, how much of the Pixar theory was intentional? Pixar has been known for placing Easter eggs in its movies, but it's unlikely they planned for all of this while they were making the films because some some of these arguments connect to films that weren't even in the making yet, and they were made by different people. But is it actually plausible? Okay, I'll admit it, some parts of this theory are tighter than others. The technology behind the doors in Monsters, Inc. is vague enough that a time-traveling element is entirely possible, which also makes the backstory of the witch from Brave probable. But seriously, nothing else connects. So in conclusion, on the plausibility meter, I give the Pixar theory a one. Fans of Disney Animation's most recent film, Frozen, spotted Rapunzel and Flynn Rider at Elsa's coronation. This naturally sparked conspiracies all across the interwebs, but one that particularly caught my eye was the theory originally found on Tumblr. What if Elsa and Anna's parents died on the way to Rapunzel's celebration, and the sunken ship found at the beginning of The Little Mermaid was that of the King and Queen of Arendelle? Tangled was released in 2010, three years before Frozen. And the story of Frozen begins three years after Elsa and Anna's parents' death. So, if the film's timelines are synced, it would make sense that Rapunzel and Flynn felt the need to attend Elsa's coronation after her parents died on the way to Rapunzel's return celebration. The conspiracy states that Tangled takes place in Germany, Frozen takes place in Norway, and The Little Mermaid takes place somewhere around Denmark. So it's possible that the sunken ship that Ariel was exploring could be the same ship. But was it really? Well, if you want to follow locations the theory states, the King and Queen of Arendelle would have to travel over the North Sea to get from Norway to Germany, passing the coast of Denmark. However, the time and location of these three Disney films is never specified. They all fall under the convenient fairy tale vagueness of once upon a time and far, far away. Well, that doesn't help us at all. So let's dig deeper. Rapunzel is a Brothers Grimm story published in 1812 in Germany. The Little Mermaid and the Snow Queen were both published by Dutch writer Hans Christian Andersen in 1837 and 1845, respectively. The Snow Queen specifically takes place in Norway, but Frozen is only loosely based on Christian Andersen's story. Arendelle is a fictional country heavily influenced by Norwegian, Dutch, and Austrian culture. Geographically, we might as well pretend it's somewhere near Genovia. And if we're getting really specific here, the King and Queen ship looks nothing like the one Ariel scavenging at the beginning of The Little Mermaid. Rapunzel and Flynn were confirmed to be Easter eggs by Disney animators, but unfortunately, our Tangled friends are about as non-canon in the Frozen universe as Scar is in Hercules or as Goofy is in The Little Mermaid. The conspiracy definitely makes sense, but because the ships don't match up and the time and location of these three films are vague enough, it just cannot be proven. So on the plausibility meter, I give the Frozen, Tangled, and Little Mermaid theory a three and a half out of five.
Are you ready, kids? What if your favorite phylum periphera, who lived in a tropical fruit deep in the ocean, was actually a result of nuclear radiation? I'm here to ruin your childhood with this new conspiracy about your favorite sponge and rectangular pants. Get this. Bikini Bottom is underneath a real live place, an atoll called Bikini Atoll, part of the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean. In 1946, the US government detonated a couple of atomic bombs in Bikini Atoll as a part of Operation Crossroads, one of which was set off underwater. The radiation then affected these once normal creatures and their environments, making it possible for a crab to open a restaurant, or a squid to play clarinet, or a sea sponge to wear pants and a tie. So could this really be about our friends of Bikini Bottom? Well, as it turns out, this is all very true. Bikini Atoll is a real place, and these nuclear detonations really happened. And not only that, but all of this was actually confirmed in the pilot script of SpongeBob SquarePants. So on the plausibility meter, I guess I have to give the SpongeBob conspiracy a five out of five. I don't know about you guys, but for me, the mid-2000s were prime time for after-school cartoons. One of my favorites being Ed, Ed, and Eddie. But what if all of the kids in the show were actually dead, and the cul-de-sac they lived on is purgatory? Ugh, creepy, right? So why could this actually make sense? Well, first of all, like any good cartoon, there are never any adults in the show. Actually, the only adult we've ever seen is Eddie's older brother, and if you remember that episode correctly, he was sort of a huge jerk. Yet he only shows up once, so it's possible that the kids could have been visiting him in hell. I mean, it all makes sense considering the kids already look like they're dead, too. Because you know, I haven't seen too many kids with yellowish skin and blue tongues, but hey, what do I know? The Kanker sisters are the only ones that aren't dead. On the contrary, they're demons that are sent to torment the kids. The conspiracy also states the kids are from different time periods and they all died in different ways. For example, Rolf is from 1903 and he died in a farming accident, Eddie is from the Great Depression, and Jimmy died in the early 2000s from leukemia. Well, that's dark. The setting of Ed, Ed, and Eddie is actually very hard to pinpoint. In some episodes, the kids are using typewriters, and in others, they're using computers. Not to mention that basically everything else is made of cardboard. Yet, they all seem to dress like mid-2000s kids. You know, like track jackets and backwards hats. While the different time periods part of the conspiracy is very interesting, it just wouldn't make sense for an Eastern European kid from the 1900s to be wearing jeans and a t-shirt in the afterlife. But I'm not one to judge, I guess. In fact, if I were to go back into any time period in fashion, I would just dress like Lizzie McGuire all the time. But that's beside the point. The purgatory conspiracy is creepy enough that I actually totally dig it. But is it plausible? Well, there's not a lot that invalidates it, but there's also nothing that proves it. I really don't want to give it a four, but I also make the rules here. So on the plausibility meter, I'm giving the Ed, Ed, Nettie conspiracy 3.75 jawbreakers out of five. I told myself I wasn't gonna make this joke, but here I go anyway. So what if Disney's Aladdin took place in a whole new world? Oh god, I hate myself so much. But listen to this. What if Aladdin took place in the very distant future in a post-apocalyptic, semi-Arabic world? The conspiracy states that Aladdin can't take place in the early Middle East. This is because when Genie is released, he says he's been in the lamp for 10,000 years, and then later in the movie, he says Aladdin's clothes are so third century. Meaning, Aladdin would have to take place in 10,300 AD. Considering all the pop culture references Genie makes, this could make sense. The part of the theory that I don't really buy is where it states that the flying carpet and all the other magic in the film is just future technology. So let's talk about this. Here's the first fact about this film. It's a Disney movie. And a common theme in Disney movies, just in case you didn't know, is magic. The genie is magic. His phenomenal cosmic power allows him to exist in any time, meaning he's able to know who Groucho Marx and Jack Nicholson are while existing somewhere around the 8th to 16th century. So let this be the only time in the history of ever that a theory will be disproven with the hard facts of magic. Sorry folks, in cartoons, magic will always be logic. So on the plausibility meter, I'm going to give the Aladdin conspiracy one and a half talking parrot sidekicks out of five. It's
It's 2014 and I'm still pretty pissed we don't have jetpacks or robot maids like America's favorite futuristic family, the Jetsons. The Jetsons live in the sky, but did you ever wonder what they lived above? Illustrator Andrew Klob created possibly one of my favorite things ever, cartoon conspiracy illustrations. Klob's piece features the conspiracy of the Jetsons actually live above the Flintstone. His theory is this, what if Orbit City is in the skies above bedrock and the Jetsons lived above the Flintstones? Klob says that in the not too distant future, the Flintstones choose to live below the Jetsons because they wish to live a simpler life. He states that both families existed at the same time because they use similar technology, they're just comprised of different materials. One chooses conveyor belts, the other chooses animal cruelty. However, Crack.com has a much darker opinion. They say, what if Bedrock was a post-apocalyptic future wasteland that's been bombed back to the Stone Age and Orbit City is just a temporary home away from home while the Earth recovered? You know, because that works so well in Wally. -E. Klob says the reason for the Flintstones' funky looking dinosaurs is a kind of genetic engineering that could only be achieved in the near future. Chris Hardwick actually talked about the same theory in his Nerdist podcast. He says that the surviving animals get a fresh start on a radiated planet and without the humans around, these animals would be free to evolve. However, the humans end up using them to replicate technology. So whether it's evolution or genetic engineering, a common theme here is that the humans are messing everything up. Oh wait, wrong theory. Now I know what you're all thinking. What about the 1987 TV movie, The Jetsons Meet the Flintstones? Elroy makes a time machine to send the family to the future, but they actually end up in bedrock. So what if, instead of traveling through time, they just teleported to the Earth's surface? Well, is it possible for these two TV families to exist in the same time? This conspiracy is surprisingly in-depth. The part that was most intriguing to me is that both of these shows aired during the height of the Cold War in the US. So it's possible that a nuclear war between the Soviets and the Americans is what created this prehistoric looking wasteland that is bedrock. There's also a lot that proves this. The Flintstones have contemporary looking money. They drive, for lack of a better word, cars, watch TV, use record players, and they even celebrate Christmas. It just wouldn't make sense for a caveman to even know what a record player is, let alone use one. And the fact that they use contemporary forms of currency and celebrate a holiday that's only existed in Western culture for the past few centuries means that the Flintstones must have had some previous experience in modern times. Of course, there's nothing concrete in either show that proves this conspiracy. In fact, it's stated that the Jetsons specifically takes place in 2062. So on the plausibility meter, I give the Jetsons and Flintstones conspiracy four robot maids out of five. Disclaimer, if you would like your childhood to remain somewhat unruined, I suggest turning off this video now. Brace yourselves, this conspiracy is a depressing one. We all remember Rugrats, right? The brightly colored cartoon about talking babies. Well, what if all the babies were just a figment of Angelica's imagination and she was suffering from schizophrenia? Still here? So for the sake of this conspiracy, all those lovable little babies, yeah, they're all dead. Chucky and his mom died in childbirth, which is why Chaz is a nervous wreck all the time. Tommy was a stillborn, which is why Stu is constantly in the basement making toys for the son he never had. The DeVilles had an abortion. Angelica couldn't figure out whether the baby was going to be a boy or a girl and instead created the twins. Oh, don't worry, it gets worse. In All Grown Up, Angelica was a bipolar schizophrenic who became addicted to various narcotics that would let her keep imagining her childhood friends. Angelica's dad remarried and Angelica's real mom actually died of a heroin overdose. Angelica's Schizophrenia is actually a result of just being a crack baby. If this giant dark ass cloud has any silver lining, it's that Susie was Angelica's only real friend. Susie played along with Angelica's twisted imagination because she knew it made her happy. So could this all really be true? The conspiracy is a good explanation as to why Angelica is the only older kid who can communicate with the babies. Except that she's not. Obviously, Susie can talk to the babies too, and some say this is just her playing along with Angelica's imagination. But are we all forgetting Rugrats in Paris where Chucky learns his first word? So it's implied at the end of the series that Chucky begins to learn to talk. All in all, this conspiracy is depressing as hell, but it's also skipping over some major plot points. So on the plausibility meter, I give the Rugrats conspiracy two and a half plastic screwdrivers out of five. After my episode about the frozen tangled of Little Mermaid conspiracy, so many of you so politely brought to my attention that I was incorrect. And that actually, when the king and queen of Arendelle's ship crashed, they didn't die somewhere between Norway and Germany, but instead washed up on the coast of Africa and raised Tarzan. 
going to do this in the nicest and most organized way possible. Here are three reasons why this conspiracy is completely ridiculous. Number one is the most obvious, that Elsa and Anna's parents look nothing like Tarzan's parents. I mean, unless somehow Monks at Sea turns you ginger, there's no resemblance. Number two is that these films take place 400 years apart. While it isn't specified exactly when Frozen takes place, we can assume it's around the Middle Ages based on the fashion and the technology. For these same reasons, as well as the novel the film is based off of, we know Tarzan takes place in the 19th century. Last but not least, a geography lesson. If we're following the original conspiracy and Elsa and Anna's parents shipwreck somewhere on the North Sea, they would have to swim a hell of a long way to end up on the jungle coast of Africa. So I hope, once and for all, this settles it. Honestly, the only connection between these two movies is a shipwreck. And if we're going based on that, you know what? What if Jack never died on the Titanic and he swam all the way to Norway to become King of Arendelle? For the record, I'm being facetious. So, on the plausibility meter, if I can even bear to consider this plausible, I give the Frozen Tarzan theory zero Olympic level swimming parents out of five. This week on Cartoon Conspiracy, we're gonna do something a little different. This week, we're gonna be talking about Easter eggs. Animators love to hide subtle references in their work. And right now, I'm gonna list every instance of A113 that I could find. In Toy Story, it's the license plate of Andy's mom's car. It appears on a box in A Bug's Life, a camera in Finding Nemo, a cell number in The Incredibles, and on various vehicles and cars. The courtroom number and up in even more vehicles and cars too. It's this door in Monsters University. And A113 is even Roman numerals and brave. But that's not all. A113 appears on a truck in Lilo and Stitch and then again in The Iron Giant. A113 has actually found its way into several episodes of The Simpsons and American Dad. And I'm still not done. A113 shows up on Agent Hannaway's ring in Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol and it's also the signal Tom Cruise's character uses to call in support. A113 even shows up twice in The Avengers. And last but not least, A113 shows up in Catching Fire. So what is A113? Well, A113 is a classroom. Let's go back to Valencia, California, 1979. In a classroom at California Institute of the Arts, future big names in animation, John Laster, Brad Bird, Andrew Stanton, Pete Docter, Tim Burton, Henry Selleck, just to name a few, were just students. CalArts, an art school founded by Walt Disney, was one of the first to offer a program in animation, taught firsthand by Disney legends. This small group of CalArts kids bonded over their student work in classroom A113 and then went on to revolutionize the animation world. So I guess A113 has become a way for these animation geniuses to mark their territory. However, A113 has expanded past just these CalArts alumni. The reason this Easter egg appears in films like The Avengers and Catching Fire is because Joss Whedon, director of The Avengers, was a writer on Toy Story, and Michael Arndt, screenwriter of Catching Fire, was a writer on Toy Story 3. Where will all this A113 madness end? Well, hopefully never. As long as these people are making movies and TV shows, we are bound to see A113 hidden somewhere on our screens. So be sure to keep your eyes peeled. If you happen to see A113 pop up somewhere that I didn't mention, let me know in the comments. And in the description below, I added some awesome videos and websites I found while doing my research for this video. And even some ridiculous conspiracies about what people thought A113 could have been. Quite possibly one of the most unique and creative shows of my generation is Craig McCracken's Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. A show about a world just like ours, except our imaginary friends coexist with us. And when we grow out of them, they go live in a foster home run by Madam Foster. Those familiar with the show know that there are three main human characters, Madam Foster, Mac, and Frankie, Madam Foster's 22-year-old granddaughter who helps at the home. But what if Frankie was actually just an imaginary friend? This conspiracy was made popular by blogger and conspirator John Negroni, who initially found it on 9 Gag. Now just bear with me here because I can't believe I'm saying this. This conspiracy is not all crazy. Negroni's theory, along with Nine Gags, is that Frankie is actually just a younger version of Madame Foster based on their similar clothing. The idea being that Madame Foster actually just imagined a younger version of herself to help her with the home when she gets to be too old. The argument being that the show never alludes to Frankie having her own imaginary friend 
or even being able to create one. And why would a 22 year old want to work at a foster home for imaginary creatures? Uh, scratch that, never mind, that would actually be super awesome. Some flaws in this conspiracy lie in an episode where Frankie goes on a date and another where she shows her driver's license. Now why would an imaginary friend go on a date or even need a driver's license? Unless she didn't know she was imaginary. This is due to evidence in the show that when these creatures are imagined, they are created with an understanding of their existence. But here's something else to think about. What if instead, Madame Foster was Frankie's imaginary friend? It's possible, and a little grim, that Madame Foster died when Frankie was very young, and dealing with the loss of her grandmother caused Frankie to imagine a version of her grandmother to keep her company while she inherited her foster home. Well, could this be true? It's definitely an interesting way of looking at these characters, but these conspiracies rely solely on meaningless plot points most likely purposely left out by the writers. And the second theory runs into a major flaw. It is explicitly stated in the show that Mr. Harriman is Madame Foster's imaginary friend, and I'm no expert at imaginary friend logic, but I'm pretty sure an imaginary friend can't then create their own imaginary friend. I'm sure there are some loopholes around this, like maybe Mr. Harriman was imagined before Madame Foster died, but still, can an imaginary friend own another imaginary friend? This is starting to get way too complicated. Let's just wrap it up. It's an interesting theory, but all in all, it just doesn't add up. So, on the plausibility meter, I give the Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends conspiracy three possibly imaginary grandmothers out of five. As if Tim Burton wasn't enough of a creepy yet mad genius already, what if he planned for Vincent, Nightmare Before Christmas, Corpse Bride, and Frankenweenie to all have one connection? This conspiracy states that all of Tim Burton's animated movies take place within the same universe, specifically that they're all about one boy and his dog. It all starts with Tim Burton's first stop motion film, Vincent. Vincent is all about a disturbed little boy who tried to turn his dog, Abercrombie, into a zombie, which resulted in the dog being given away. Abercrombie is then adopted by Victor, star of the 2012 Frankenweenie film, who then later renames him Sparky. So let's move on to Frankenweenie. And this conspiracy refers to the 2012 animated Disney version of this film, not Tim Burton's 1984 live action one. Anyway, I guess Victor's dog Sparky eventually dies for good and they bury him in a pet cemetery. Sparky becomes a spirit in an afterlife world called Halloween Town. He's then adopted by Jack Skellington, who renames him Zero. Supposedly, this connection to Sparky is why Zero's nose glows in the afterlife. This all leads to the second and final death of Sparky. Victor's parents buy him a new dog to help him get over the loss of Sparky, and Victor names the dog Scraps. When Scraps eventually dies, Victor loses it, runs away, and is eventually adopted by the Van Dorts. This all leads to the events of A Corpse Bride, where we see Scraps return just as a skeleton. Now let's take a look at all three dogs in question. You'll notice they're all about the same size with similar face structure. Okay, now back to the conspiracy. Victor then dies years later, and just like Zero, he becomes a spirit in another world. His previous experience in the underworld taught him that he needs to act and be scary. So he creates a new alias, Jack Skellington. Now, is this all true? Yeah, I don't think so. The biggest flaw in this conspiracy is a pretty big one. Corpse Bride is set in the late 1800s, while Frankenweenie takes place in the 1940s. So unless there's some unreleased sequel about Victor building a time machine, there's no way both Victors could be the same person. And another thing, Tim Burton didn't direct Nightmare Before Christmas. Burton came up with the story and preliminary sketches for Nightmare Before Christmas in 1982 while he was still at Disney, which is where he was until about 1984. He returned in 1990 after his success with Beetlejuice, Pee Wee, and Edward Scissorhands, Disney was finally excited to do Nightmare Before Christmas. However, Burton couldn't direct at the time because he was busy with Batman, so he gave the job to Henry Selleck. It's a bit of a technicality, but since Tim Burton didn't direct Nightmare Before Christmas, it doesn't really fit in his universe, especially since Henry Selleck made a lot of changes to the story. The reason all of the male leads in Tim Burton's films look the same is because they're all loosely based on Burton himself. The majority of Burton's films are based off of childhood stories or experiences he had growing up. Burton was very close with his dogs as a kid, so this is why every male character can be seen with a dog. And no, they're not necessarily all the same dog either. If we take a look at the series Family Dog, on which Burton was a character designer, we can gather that he just doesn't have a lot of variety when it comes to drawing dogs. While this is an interesting conspiracy, based on the inaccurate timeline and interviews with Burton stating otherwise, 
I'm gonna have to give the Tim Burton conspiracy one and a half Jack Skellingtons out of five. Now, what could be even cuter about a raccoon-like creature who's the best friend of two little girls? Well, what if neighbor Totoro was all just a metaphor for murder? Creepypasta forums and Crack.com articles have been abuzz with this particular conspiracy. That Studio Ghibli's Tonori no Totoro, or My Neighbor Totoro, is actually about the Sayama incident and all the friendly creatures in the film represent death. Warning, this is a little graphic, so if you'd like to skip ahead in the video a little bit, go ahead. The case occurred May 1st, 1963 in Sayama City, Saitama, Japan, where a man kidnapped and killed a 16-year-old girl. Now before we get too in-depth with the conspiracy, you're going to have to excuse me on my pronunciation of some of these words. In the film, the oldest daughter's name is Satsuki, which is a traditional name for Mei in Japanese, and the youngest daughter's name is Mei, which in English obviously sounds like the month of May. Early in the film, the two sisters begin to see things and in Japanese folklore, seeing things usually means you're going to die. The real life model for the family's home is located in Sayama Hills, and the movie's location was inspired by Tokorozawa City, which happens to be next to Sayama City. Well, I guess this explains why the title of the film is My Neighbor, Totoro. Now this part, gets a little creepy. The girl in the Sayama incident had an older sister who actually committed suicide after the loss of her little sister. However, before she died, it's rumored that the older sister began hallucinating a raccoon or cat-like ghost. So this could mean that the Totoros are angels of death. Yay! The old woman in the film says that adults cannot see the Susu Atari, or mythical beasts. What isn't explained though is why she could see them when she was young, but Kanta, her grandson, doesn't seem to see them. So it's not necessary that all children can see the spirits. In the film, Satsuki asks the Totoros for help, and Catbus takes her to where Mei is, which, if we're following the theory, is the afterlife. What proves that? Catbus's sign translates to Grave Road. And some people think Catbus is a one-way trip to heaven, or maybe hell. And when Mei goes missing, she's seen crying at the feet of Jizo statues. In Japanese culture, Jizo is a protector of children. The spirit takes care of the souls of unborn children and those who die at a young age. So at the end of the movie, the girls return home with their mother, who's been in the hospital for the majority of the film. Or do they? In the final scene, none of the characters have shadows almost like ghosts. So maybe the youngest daughter goes on missing, eventually dies, and the oldest daughter ultimately commits suicide. Just like the Sayama incident. Fortunately, as it turns out, this conspiracy is nothing more than urban legend. While the events of the Sayama incident are true, its connection to my neighbor Totoro is just rumor. And before you get too up in arms about trying to prove this, Studio Ghibli released a statement dispelling this rumor. They say the reason the girls don't have shadows is because the animators were too lazy, I mean, decided that shadows were unnecessary in that scene. Miyazaki also said that the girls in the film were inspired by his friend's daughters. It's also been said that the older sister in the Sayama incident never saw any rodent-type ghost. Here are also a couple other rebuttals to this conspiracy. Regarding the film's location, it's supposedly proven by the logo on a Sayama tea box in the back of one of the scenes. Sayama is a very popular tea in Japan, so it doesn't necessarily prove anything. Actually, if they're going to a hospital in the Hachikoku area, which is the area the movie is actually based on as far as the setting's appearance goes. Then they couldn't possibly live in Sayama because we see the girls biking to the hospital and there's no way you can bike from Sayama to Hachikoku. And finally, a lyric in Cat Bus's song translates to those who ride are cheerful ghosts. However, obake in Japanese doesn't mean ghost like it does in English. It doesn't mean dead person, but it is synonymous with yurei, which are dead people. Obake can be a forest spirit or any other kind of creature or monster as well. The cat bus is a bus for obake. Totoro is an obake and I've probably pronounced that horribly wrong. On that note, the fact that cat bus says tomb road literally doesn't mean anything. All in all, while this conspiracy runs into a lot of coincidences with the Sayama incident, Studio Ghibli did confirm it to be untrue. Technically, I should give this conspiracy a zero out of five, but I do wanna give it some bonus points for being so thorough. So, on the plausibility meter, I give the Totoro conspiracy two raccoon cat-like ghost creature things out of five.
break out those acid wash jeans and tie a hoodie around your waist, we're taking a trip back to the 90s to rediscover two educational cartoons. Did the kids from Magic School Bus turn into the Planeteers from Captain Planet? Take a look at this picture. How did we not see this before? So the way the two shows line up is this. Arnold becomes Wheeler. Carlos becomes Ma T. Dorothy Ann becomes Yinka. Wanda Lee becomes Guy. And Tim becomes Quam. <laughs> As if, right? Well, the conspiracy I found is this. Gaia, spirit of the earth, kidnapped a bunch of kids, put them on an island where she brainwashed them into thinking they were in school and pretended to be their teacher, Miss Frizzle. But it really was an indoctrination camp where she could create the perfect pollution fighters by instilling a love of science and ecology into them at a young age. However, not all of the kids made the cut. Phoebe resisted the brainwashing, unable to forget her previous life and constantly making references to her old school. Janet, as per usual, was skeptical of Gaia's plan and convinced Ralphie to escape the island with her, only later to be driven mad by their memories. Eventually, they turned to a life of crime, becoming Hawkish Greedley and Dr. Blight, respectively. Keisha's whereabouts, however, are unknown. When her class had matured sufficiently, Miss Frizzle slash Gaia sent the kids out as eco-friendly sleeper agents until she needed them. Then years later, she gave them their power rings and sent them out on a series of ecological adventures. So could these two 90s after school shows really have a connection? In the first episode of Captain Planet, you meet each of the planeteers on their respective countries and they make references to their past throughout the show. Both of these can be reasons why they don't just know each other from school. Of course, this is where the sleeper agent part of the conspiracy becomes very convenient. If Gaia really wanted to create eco-friendly superheroes in secret, she just might have erased their memories and changed their entire lives up until they were reunited as the Planeteers. As for the age differences between both of the shows, the conspiracy states that the mysterious time effects of Gaia's Island is what creates these discrepancies. But that sort of feels like a stretch. So let's break this down even further. Obviously their appearances line up pretty well, but their personalities, in my opinion, not so much. Arnold, the cowardly nerd kid, is supposed to become Wheeler, the hothead. Pun intended, probably. Because, you know, fire and temper and... Anyway, and the argument that Ralph and Janet are supposed to become Earth-hating supervillains while Keisha goes missing, also seems a little bogus to me. It's as if we're just stretching the facts to fit the conspiracy. But now for some technical stuff. Captain Planet aired four years before the Magic School Bus. They were written by completely different people and initially aired on different networks. So theoretically, they can't be in the same universe. Odds are these two properties are just a sign of the times and nothing more. Captain Planet came first and it found a lot of success with its cast of diverse characters. Perhaps the Magic School Bus producers were just trying to repackage the concept and duplicate the success. I mean, it does happen a lot in animation. The image is great and it would make such a cool idea, but I just don't think it fits. But it might make some great fan fiction. I'm giving the Captain Planet Magic School Bus Conspiracy Two chameleons out of five. Mmm, donuts. Wait, what? Unless you've been living under a rock for the past 25 years, you know America's longest running sitcom family, The Simpsons, makes its living entertaining us with their idiotic antics. What if The Simpsons family was actually fooling us and they were all secretly geniuses? So get this, all of the Simpsons are geniuses, but only Lisa chooses to show it. This is because the rest of the family chooses happiness over intelligence. Grandpa may be senile, but in his flashbacks he's shown doing things that require a variety of skills, such as being a fighter pilot and an accomplished pianist. This suggests that he has an at least above average level of intelligence. I couldn't find the specifics, but I've heard it's been mentioned a couple times in the series that Marge actually went to college and received a degree, but she chose to be a stay-at-home mom. And Homer would have been intelligent if it wasn't for the crayon he shoved up his brain at a young age. This is actually proven in an episode in season 12 where Homer gets the crayon removed from his brain and he temporarily becomes a genius doing things like proving God doesn't exist. But he puts it back in order to avoid ostracism from his family and his community. Witnessing this, Bart sees that his dad is actually happier being an idiot and makes a decision to live in ignorance of his intelligence at a much younger age and without having to alter his brain. However, 
Bart's intelligence leaks through on several occasions when it comes to his clever and original pranks. Bart torments Lisa because he feels bad for her and he wants her to make the same decision he made because supposedly Lisa's intelligence is what makes her unhappy. Maggie, being a baby, has not been forced to make this decision yet although she already appears to be as intelligent as the rest of her family. For example, one time she saved Homer from a crazed tow truck driver and has a scary level of expertise when it comes to firearms. So is it really possible this family has been hiding their smarts from the rest of the world? In Season 9, Dr. Simpson explains something called the Simpsons gene. This is what causes baldness, laziness, and eventually idiocy in male Simpsons. However, the Simpson gene only affects the Y chromosome, so Maggie and Lisa are safe. The theory says that Bart made the conscious decision to live in ignorance because of his dad, but is it instead possible that he's slowly slipping into idiocy because of the Simpsons gene? The gene also doesn't affect every Simpson in the same way. Homer's half-brother Herb graduated from Harvard and started his own successful company. This brings us to the episode in season 12 where Homer temporarily becomes a genius. When the crayon is removed, Homer's IQ actually only goes up to 105, which, according to Google, is just average. While he is smarter than usual, people usually aren't considered gifted until they score higher than a 130. So even at his smartest, Homer is still definitely not a genius. However, it is shown that Homer's family and friends begin to ostracize him because of his newfound intelligence, and he chooses to stick the crayon back up his brain to become stupid and happy again. So genius? is kind of a stretch for this family. I mean, the female Simpsons definitely tend to be more intelligent. So if we're going by the literal conspiracy that the Simpsons are all secretly geniuses, I'd have to give this conspiracy like a one out of five, but that's no fun. While they're definitely not geniuses, I do believe there are some smarts the Simpsons might be hiding from us. So on that note, I give the Simpsons conspiracy four donuts out of five. We all know Adventure Time. It's insanely popular and probably the most out there cartoon on television right now. Following the adventures of a human boy named Finn and his best friend, Jake the Dog, Adventure Time can be described as anything from science fantasy to surreal humor, and most commonly, post-apocalyptic. It's no wonder why the show has sparked so many conspiracy theories, and I couldn't pick just one. So, here are my top five Adventure Time conspiracies. Number five, Finn is in a coma. Finn is just a regular boy, and his only friend in the world is his dog, Jake. Already neglected by his family, after Jake dies, Finn attempts suicide, but instead ends up in a coma. However, in his comatose state, he's able to imagine a world where he can go on adventures with his best friend, Jake, forever. This is my least favorite conspiracy because, well, first of all, it's super sad. And second of all, it just doesn't fit in that well with the show. Finn doesn't know or remember anything from his past life in the real world because Jake's parents found him abandoned as a baby. So for this conspiracy to make sense, Finn would have to have been in a coma since he was very young. But how would a baby know about nukes, demons, the fourth dimension, Earth's core, comets, Abe Lincoln, vampires? You get the idea. Adventure Time has a very complex plot and deals with some heavy emotions, stuff that a very little kid probably wouldn't dream up. Number four. The stories of Adventure Time are actually just Finn and his dad's role-playing game. Jake is really Finn's dad, and the show is actually just a Dungeons & Dragons-like game that he runs to hang out with his son. Jake creates the villains and the challenges to test Finn's moral code and teach him life lessons. In an interview, creator Pendleton Ward said he grew up playing Dungeons & Dragons and writing Adventure Time feels like he's playing D&D with the characters. And watching the show, you can tell that it's heavily inspired by this role-playing game. For example, the Enchiridion looks pretty similar to the Dungeons & Dragons player handbook. So while the plausibility of this conspiracy in the context of the show's plot is probably unlikely, it's still an adorable idea. Number three, Adventure Time and the Misadventures of Flapjack are in the same universe. The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack was a show that aired on Cartoon Network until 2010, and it's where Pendleton Ward had one of his first jobs as a writer and a storyboard artist. Flapjack's dock town, Stormlong Harbor, could have been built after the Mushroom War mentioned in Adventure Time. The events of both shows are happening on the same timeline, which could explain some cracks within the show's side stories. The Candied Island they saw in Flapjack was actually just Candy Kingdom. Peppermint Larry has been to Candy Kingdom and possibly used Princess Bubblegum as sort of a muse for his candy wife. Honestly, 
I couldn't find a lot that proved or disproved this conspiracy. It's possible that Penn's work on Flapjack inspired some elements in Adventure Time, and a reason these two shows never collided could be due to Finn's fear of the ocean. But also, Candied Island didn't look too much like Candy Kingdom. So really, this conspiracy isn't necessarily possible or impossible. Number two. Simon Petrikoff's Bedtime Stories The Land of Ooh and the Adventures of Finn and Jake are really just bedtime stories Simon Petrikoff tells to a young Marceline. The format of an Adventure Time episode is similar to that of a children's story, and that they usually involve learning some kind of lesson. Simon creates the character of the powerful vampire queen along with an alternate reality to build the confidence of a young, orphaned Marceline. In this flashback, we see Simon kissing a young Marceline, and in his backpack, we see several books. Could these be the stories he's telling her? We've also seen the book Ice King writes about Fiona and Cake, so this proves that he is a writer and a storyteller. It's a sweet idea, but if conspiracy was true and Simon was narrating every single episode of Adventure Time to a young Marceline, why does the Ice King appear so often? And finally, number one, the conspiracy of the Great Mushroom War. This is by far the most plausible Adventure Time conspiracy. What could be the explanation for all these strange looking characters and bizarre landscapes? Besides the fact that it's a cartoon. Try nuclear radiation. The Great Mushroom War referenced throughout the series is actually a nuclear war that caused serious mutation. There are a lot of heavy hints in the show that allude to a great nuclear explosion. So here's everything we know about the Great Mushroom War so far. A thousand years ago, there was a terrible war and Simon and Marceline were the only ones left. Simon was saved by the bombs, which Marceline said bathed the land in mutagenic horror by a cursed crown that slowly turned him into the Ice King. After hundreds of years, the Land of Ooh came into existence, but this was only in one universe. In the episodes Finn the Human and Jake the Dog, we see an alternate universe where Simon sacrificed his life to stop the bomb. When Simon died, his crown covered the world in ice. But in this universe, we can see that the Earth is whole, as opposed to the Land of Ooze universe where there's a huge chunk missing. So we can assume this is because of a nuclear explosion. We can also see nuclear bombshells at the beginning of the opening credits. This conspiracy is basically true. It's just never been admitted in the show. But nothing gets past us conspirators. Now these were just a few of the many Adventure Time conspiracies. If you have a favorite conspiracy that I didn't cover today, let me know in the comments below. And in the meantime, keep conspirating. This has been our most requested conspiracy yet. In fact, the show is so jam-packed with conspiracies, I had to bring in Chad from Looptoons for some backup. This is one of the most popular cartoons on TV right now, and the internet has taken quite a liking to it. It's Gravity Falls. I am a huge fan of the show. I even got the chance to attend a panel as a part of LA Film Fest to hear creator Alex Hirsch and voices of Dipper and Mabel, Jason Ritter, and Christian Schall talk about the show. So I'm not about to pick favorites here, but this is a conspiracy I've wanted to do for a very, very long time. If you've never heard of Gravity Falls, here's the lowdown. Twins Dipper and Mabel are forced to spend the summer in Gravity Falls, Oregon, working at their Grunkle Stan's tourist trap, the Mystery Shack. At first, Gravity Falls just seems like a quirky little town in the middle of nowhere, but there's definitely more than meets the eye. Not only is it filled with creepy creatures, strange magic, and some bizarre town folk, Signs in the show allude that there's something even bigger happening in Gravity Falls. Many of the mysteries in this town lie within hidden symbols throughout the show. Symbols that, in most cases, refer to real-life conspiracies. Oh, hi, and thanks for having me, Emily. It's great to be here. Now, uh, what do all of these hidden symbols actually mean? Now, before we begin, Heed this warning. If you haven't seen Gravity Falls, there will be some light spoilers in this video. If you would like to remain completely unspoiled, I recommend turning off this video now, watching all of season one, and then coming back. Go on, I'll give you a second. Are they still here? Okay, here we go. From Mayan calendars to cryptic writing, spooky souvenirs, and possibly satanic goats, Gravity Falls is filled with real-world secret symbols and signs. The biggest by far, however, is the all-seeing eye, or the Eye of Providence. And Chad here is gonna tell us more about it. It flashes at the end of the theme song, and it's hidden all around the mystery shack. The stained glass window, rugs, and it even replaces the A in shack here. And most importantly, and Spoiler alert, this season's main villain was Bill Cipher, and he pretty much looks exactly like the Eye of Providence. So what could it actually mean? 
In U.S. history, the Eye of Providence is most notably associated with the Freemasons, an infamously secret society. It appears on the dollar bill with the motto, a new, a new, a new co coptus, a new, and we coptus, and, and... A new, hmm, it's co... A new it coeptus. Sounds like a Harry Potter spell. Eh, whatever. This translates to he approves our undertakings. He being God in this case. You know who else sees everything? Most recently, the eye has been associated with something else, the Illuminati. Another secret society loosely tied to the Masons that has been accused of everything from striking deals with aliens to establishing new world order. In Gravity Falls, the mystery shack seems to house more of these signs than any place else. In the Gravity Falls online game Rumble's Revenge, there's a secret hidden message which reveals that there is, in fact, a secret society in the town. Some things about Grunkle Stan seem to hint that he is, or maybe was, a member of said secret society. Or maybe even the leader of it. Could the Mystery Shack have been their meeting place, or even presently is their meeting place? And just what is Stan hiding? Let's take a look at the screen that flashes at the end of the theme song. When decoded, this jumble of letters translates to Stan is not what he seems. Hmm, that's awfully cryptic. Stan is definitely the show's most mysterious character. He's essentially never seen without his red fez featuring a gold symbol. Do you know who else wore red fezes? The Shriners also known as the Ancient Arabic Order of the Mystic Shrine. The Shriners are a fraternity that branch off the Freemasons and are also somehow loosely related to the Illuminati. And the symbol on the Shriner's Fez looks eerily similar to that of Grunkle Stan's. When Stan is playing the eccentric Mystery Shack tour guide, he covers one eye, but never the same eye. The unneeded eye covering is a sign coined by the Illuminati to pay tribute to their mascot, the Eye of Providence. So let's see, Secret Society, Eye of Providence, Fezes, Eye Patches, there seems to be quite a few coincidences here. So is Gravity Falls actually subliminal messaging for these secret organizations? Could Grunkle Stan actually be a member of the Shriners or the Illuminati? Or is creator Alex Hirsch just messing with us? I'm gonna say it's the last one. Alex Hirsch is probably just messing with us. Yep, I'd have to agree. I'd be hard pressed to say he was an influence inspired or even knowingly referencing these already established secret societies in Gravity Falls. Actually, at the panel I attended, Alex said the reason you see the triangle man symbol so many times throughout the show is to simply foreshadow Bill Cipher showing that he truly is everywhere. So screenwriting technique or subliminal messaging? I'll let you make your own decision. Will they actually admit that the eluded secret society in Gravity Falls is the Illuminati? I'm leaning towards probably not. Even if they do, they will most likely have a different name for it with some slightly different ideas. Probably no New World Order, but hey, that's just my guess. After all, this is a Disney show. But with just one season done and season two airing August 1st, we will simply just have to wait and see. Funny to think that a cartoon starring a little pink dog could still give me nightmares to this very day. But can you blame me? If you don't remember the show or if your parents didn't let you watch it, Curse the Cowardly Dog is about an elderly couple and their pink dog Courage who live in the middle of nowhere, where aliens, talking plants, and giant feet just seem to stop by on a regular basis. But what if all of the scary monsters Courage encounters are actually just other humans he's unfamiliar with, and that maybe Courage is just a normal dog seeing things through a dog's eyes? According to this conspiracy, Eustace Muriel and their pink dog Courage don't actually live in the middle of nowhere. They never encounter any strange and creepy creatures, and for the most part, they're never in any real danger where their only hope of survival is up to their little dog. This conspiracy makes a lot of sense and explains why Eustace and Muriel never seem to realize they're in any grave danger. Because, in reality, 
They're just watching their dumb dog run around. Courage was abandoned as a puppy by his original owners and then later adopted by Eustace and Muriel. Being an elderly couple, they probably couldn't walk him as often and therefore Courage only became familiar with his home, which then felt like it was in the middle of nowhere. So then, everyone who came near his home was strange, new, and a threat to his owners. For example, there is an episode where Muriel is taken by a giant talking vulture, but as it turns out, she was just watching over the vulture's babies. In reality, Muriel was probably just babysitting for a friend, and Courage's naive doggy brain filled in the gaps of what he didn't recognize and jumped to terrifying conclusions. In another episode, Muriel is kidnapped by a pair of shifty raccoons, but when Courage goes to find her, he sees she's not in any real danger at all and that the raccoons were actually just looking for a mother. And when Eustace tries to capture the raccoons, Muriel repeatedly calls them children. So maybe the raccoons were actually just neighborhood kids who lost their mother and Courage perceived them as raccoons because he's never seen a human child before. So did we actually just watch a cartoon that was told through an anxious dog's eyes? If any of you are dog owners, you've probably found great amusement confusing your dog with strange noises or scaring them with vacuum cleaners. Well, a team of psychologists at the University of Milan found that the behavior and actions of dogs is actually very similar to that of young children. Dogs often experience fear and anxiety when they're in a new and unfamiliar situation. That amount of anxiety though depends on the dog's breed and the individual dog. Signs that a dog is experiencing anxiety include body language such as hair raising, trembling, cowering, whimpering, as well as clinging to their owner. Dogs who experience a traumatic event as puppies, such as abandonment, often experience more anxiety. A huge factor on how fearful a dog is also depends on their socialization, basically their interactions with people, animals, and different environments. Bet you didn't think you were gonna learn a lot about dog psychology today. To my knowledge, creator of the show John R. Dilworth has never mentioned any part of this conspiracy to be true. Yet, the dog psychology does shed a lot of light on the reasoning for Courage's actions. Unfortunately, with no confirmation from the creator or the studio, I can't give this conspiracy a perfect score. But on the other hand, I can argue with science. So, on the plausibility meter, I give the Courage the Cowardly Dog Conspiracy four and a half chickens from outer space out of five. Plus, I'll be giving out bonus points for anyone who can explain this guy, because I got nothing. So I don't know about you guys, but one of the highlights of my childhood was Pokemon. I played all the games and I collected all the cards. But one thing I really remember was the anime. A lighthearted show with a positive message about capturing wild animals and then forcing them to fight each other. Now to help me better understand this conspiracy better, I asked my good friend and fellow cartoon conspiracy expert, John, to help me out. What's up everybody? I am John. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Emily, thank you so much for letting me take the reins with explaining this theory. What if the protagonist of the show, Ash Ketchum, was actually in a coma the entire time? After the first episode, the tone of the Pokemon series changes. This happens after Ash is in a biking accident and struck by Pikachu's lightning. Now the reasoning behind this being believed is because after this traumatic incident in Ash's life, he is rushed to the hospital where he is treated with heavy medications including sedatives and painkillers. And it's these heavy medications that cause Ash to fall into a coma. Supposedly, Ash's coma is the reason why his journeys after the first episode are able to cover such vast distances with really no difficulty at all, Team Rocket becomes less menacing, and his physical appearance never really changes throughout the entire series. The coma is also the reason why throughout the rest of the series, Ash never uses a bike again, and why every town he visits has the same nurse, Nurse Joy, and same police officer, Officer Jenny. The events of the Pokemon series do sound like every 10 year old boy's dream. No school, no parents, getting to travel the world with your pets and your much older and much more attractive best friends. And despite not having a whole lot of training, you are somehow the best Pokemon trainer in the world. So could the events of the Pokemon series actually just be the comatose dreams of Ash Ketchum? No need to fear Pokemon purists, this conspiracy runs into some flaws. First off, the alleged bike lightning accident happens in the very first episode. But 
Ash doesn't meet Team Rocket until the second episode. So it wouldn't make much sense for them to become less menacing if Ash had never met them in the first place. Also, Ash does use a bike again. In another episode of season one, Ash shows no fear of bikes and actually wanted one, but couldn't afford it. And fun fact, the reason it seems like it's the same nurse joy in every town is actually because they're all related and Joy is their family name. And there are also several Officer Jennies in the Pokemon world. So while for the most part the Pokemon anime doesn't make much sense and its consistency is pretty questionable, there's enough evidence here to prove this conspiracy flawed. Actually, I would consider this more of an interpretation of the show as opposed to an actual conspiracy. Calling this a fan interpretation really hits the nail right on the head. One of the key elements to a good conspiracy theory is that it can change the entire tone of the show and, as a result, change the viewing experience for the audience. Ultimately, Ash being in a coma really doesn't change the tone of the series that much and honestly, it can be forgotten after the first couple of episodes. Episodes. In the end, whether it's all a dream or not, the show ends up being virtually the same and gives the audience the same impression that it intends to. And if we've learned anything from these cartoon conspiracies, it's that some people just enjoy ruining other people's childhoods. So while the anime may have some consistency problems, the arguments given for the Ash and Akoma conspiracy just don't add up. So on the plausibility meter, I give the Pokemon conspiracy one and a half Togepi's out of five. Oh, Cartoon Network in the early to mid 2000s. What a wonderful time for cartoons. But two shows in particular that people just can't seem to get over is Samurai Jack and the Powerpuff Girls. So much so that some have sparked this conspiracy. Could Samurai Jack and the Powerpuff Girls take place in the same universe? Both of these shows aired on Cartoon Network in the early 2000s and had pretty similar art styles. Samurai Jack followed the story of a samurai warrior whose single quest was to find a way to travel back in time and defeat Aku, the demonic shape-shifting wizard. While the Powerpuff Girls centered around three little girls with superpowers, Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup, who were created by Professor Utonium and lived in the fictional town of Townsville. This popular conspiracy stems from a couple images from both shows that are pretty similar. The conspiracy speculates that Professor Utonium is a descendant of Samurai Jack. The professor was given Jack's sword as a family heirloom, which carried a little bit of Aku's blood. The professor took the blood and created Chemical X, which he then used to create the Powerpuff Girls. However, the professor then unknowingly releases Aku back into the world. Aku sees what the professor is then created with his own blood. Enraged, he goes back in time to send Jack into the future, preventing him from having any family of his own and therefore inevitably preventing the professor from creating the Powerpuff Girls. So here's the supposed timeline of everything. Samurai Jack takes place somewhere around feudal Japan, and the Powerpuff Girls could possibly be set in the latter half of the 20th century. So if this is true, that means that by the time the Powerpuff Girls show up, Aku has been in control of the Earth for about 400 years. Well, this could explain why many of the monsters just show up randomly in Townsville. They were actually sent by Aku in an attempt to conquer the city. And the fact that later we see a destroyed Townsville while Jack is traveling in the future could mean that Aku succeeded. So, could these shows really take place in the same universe? It's hard to ignore that these shows are very similar stylistically. However, there is a logical explanation for this. Creators of the Powerpuff Girls and Samurai Jack, Craig McCracken and Gendy Tarkovsky had both worked at Hanna-Barbera, the animation studio that produced shows like Yogi Bear, Tom and Jerry, Scooby-Doo, and The Flintstones, and was famous for their style of limited animation, flat colors, and dynamic shapes. So then why all of the Powerpuff Girls references in Samurai Jack? Well, Gendy was actually a producer on the Powerpuff Girls before he started work on Samurai Jack. But it's not only Powerpuff Girls references hidden in that show. We can also see cameos from other animated shows like Quick Draw McGraw, Leonardo, Big Dog, and Chewbacca. I highly doubt these are canon in the show, so we can just assume that Gendy wanted to pay homage to his other animation influences. Okay, so then what's the reason for all of the monsters in Townsville? Well, it could make sense for all of them to be sent by Aku. The real reason the Powerpuff Girls are constantly fighting monsters is actually because Townsville is located near Monster Isle, which, as you can assume, is overpopulated by monsters. Still convinced this theory is true? Well, when asked in an AMA on Reddit if Powerpuff Girls and Samurai Jack take place in the same universe, Gendy Tarkovsky simply said, 
no. And with that being said, I unfortunately have to give this conspiracy a zero out of five. Hey guys, I know what we're gonna do today. I'm sure I'm not the only one who is super jealous of Phineas and Ferb's seven year long summer vacation. Phineas and Ferb are a pair of stepbrothers that live in Danville, a tri-state area that is constantly in near danger of Dr. Doofenshmirtz's not so evil plans. But do you think that Dr. Doofenshmirtz could actually be Candace and Phineas's real dad? Phineas is a pretty astounding inventor for only being a kid. Is it possible that he picked up his inventing skills from somewhere else? It's been indicated in the show that Phineas and Candace's mom, Linda, once dated Dr. Doofenshmirtz in the 80s. So, let's take a trip back into the dating lives of cartoon characters. At some point, Doofenshmirtz and his now ex-wife Charlene had their daughter, Vanessa. According to this conspiracy though, Doof cheated on Charlene with Linda after Vanessa was born. Then, about two years later, Linda had Candace. Somewhere in there, Charlene and Doofenshmirtz got divorced, and he then married Linda, and then they had Phineas. Then, I guess Linda divorced Doofenshmirtz, although I can't can't really blame her. He had full custody of Vanessa and therefore forgot all about Phineas and Candace. We can assume he left the kids pretty early because neither of them grew up with the real father figure until Linda remarried. Also, Candace and Doofenshmirtz have seen each other several times, but never seem to recognize one another. And it is true, the Flynn children do have some physical similarities to Dr. Doofenshmirtz, like their long necks and blue eyes. Phineas and Doof are also two of the only characters in the show that have triangular shaped heads and they both have a knack for inventing. Well, could there be baby daddy drama in Danville? I hate myself for saying that. I mean, I love a little baby daddy drama as much as the next girl, but Let's not get too excited. In the episode, What Do It Do? Doof tells Perry that after their first date, he never sees Linda ever again, which cancels out the whole marriage, two children together thing since they only saw each other once. As for Doofenshmirtz and Phineas's physical similarities, co-creator of the show and character designer Jeff Marsh said he wanted both characters to be edgy, hence triangles. Marsh said that Phineas is edgy in a nice way and Doofenshmirtz is edgy in a sad, pathetic way. Do you need more proof? On a panel, creators of the show Jeff Marsh and Dan Pavamir denied this entire theory. And with that being said, I have to give the Phineas and Ferb conspiracy zero secret agent platypi out of five. This group of fictional fourth graders essentially raised the bar of what it was like to be a kid at recess. The show centered around six kids and their elementary school antics. But what if the recess game was actually ghosts forever living on the playground of Third Street School? Similar to the Ed, Ed and Eddie theory, basically all of the kids of recess are dead and their ghosts are forever trapped in Third Street Elementary School. So here's the actual theory and get ready because it's a long one. Third Street School was built after World War I, and TJ Detweiler was among the first to attend. When the Great Depression hit, TJ was leading the students in a revolt against the school's budget cut when he was hit by an ice cream truck and died. Mikey came to the school in 1929. He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and fell into a diabetic coma and then somehow died of a heart attack at age 10. Spinelli arrived in 1933 and somehow was able to talk to the ghosts of TJ and Mikey. She ended up dying in a fight on the playground. Randall came to the school in 1944. He told in a kid who was beating up a second grader and when that kid got detention, he came to Randall's house in the middle of the night and killed him. Great. Gus transferred to 3rd Street in 1951 and could communicate with the ghosts of TJ, Mikey, and Spinelli as well. He was bullied a lot and also died in a fight. The Tylers and the Ashleys arrived in 1958. They were rival gang groups and one night when both groups were holding slumber parties, they were all coincidentally murdered by a serial killer. Gretchen came in 1962 and was the smartest girl in her class. In 1965, Becky Benson stole her science project and, in a fit of anger, 
Gretchen killed herself. Sam and Dave came in 1968 and apparently died in a coal mining accident outside of school. Vince arrived in 1978. In 1982, he tripped and broke his leg, making it unable for him to play sports ever again. He attempted suicide but ended up dying in an asylum instead. And finally, King Bob arrived in 1991. After being elected fourth grade president, he went mad with power and murdered the entire student body. He was sent to juvenile hall and then was eventually murdered by another inmate in 2001. Third Street School was eventually shut down in 2002, but the ghosts of the kids still haunt the playground as if recess never ended. Okay, what the f Not only is this theory horribly depressing, it also makes no sense. First of all, if you were the ghost of a child, why would you choose to spend the entirety of your afterlife in school? It makes sense for TJ Spinelli and Gus to be forever trapped in Third Street School, but the other kids either died at home or in some kind of facility. And if we're to believe the animated series is actually about ghosts of school children, why are there teachers and other school faculty? The theory says they're forever stuck in recess, but why are they in class so much? And what about their parents? In numerous episodes, the kids go home and are with their families. They also go on a number of field trips. If the playground is supposed to be purgatory, it's pretty lenient for letting the kids leave whenever they want. A couple of other minor things. The Tylers and the Ashleys aren't rival gangs. The Tylers are the Ashley's little brothers. King Bob is also a sixth grader, not a fourth grader. And if the kids are all from supposedly different time periods, why do they all have pretty modern, casual clothing? Also, the pilot of recess is Gus's first day at Third Street School. And if we're to follow this theory, wouldn't he have been the last to die? And if we can assume the theory takes place the same time the show aired, which was 1997 to 2001, and King Bob didn't die until 2001? How could he have interacted with the other kids at school if he wasn't a ghost yet and still at juvie? Even more things wrong with this theory. In the TV movie Recess Taking Fifth Grade, the kids promote to the fifth grade and Bob graduates to middle school. Why would ghosts further their education? And what about Recess All Grow Down where the kids are all kindergartners? Someone explain that! Ugh, this conspiracy makes almost no sense. It feels as if whoever wrote this conspiracy has never seen an actual episode of the show. The playground purgatory idea is interesting, but not well thought out at all. So, on the plausibility meter, I give the recess conspiracy half of a dodgeball out of five. Are you guys pondering what I'm pondering? Yeah, but how are we gonna teach a pig how to break dance? Pinky and the brain. One is a genius and the other is insane. We always assumed that brain was a genius and Pinky was just the dim-witted sidekick. But could it be the other way around? We're watching the show from Brain's point of view, and in his dark little rat brain, the world is just an evil place that needs to be dictated. According to this theory, Brain suffers from anxiety, but his narcissism leads him to believe that he's the perfect person, or rodent, to rule the world. Pinky is actually the genius. Don't believe me? Let's take a look at the basic story structure of any Pinky and the Brain episode. First, Brain makes a plan. And then Pinky makes an observation about a flaw in Brain's plan, but Brain ignores it. Pinky turns out to be right, and finally, Brain fails. A more specific example. In the second episode of the show, Brain builds a robotic suit to compete in a Jeopardy-type game show, but ends up losing because he didn't know the answer to a question that Pinky answered correctly. Also in that same episode, we see that Pinky is able to read and Brain is barely even able to write his own name. Even better evidence comes from the episode That Smarts, in which Brain uses a calculation to figure out exactly why his plans fail. At first, his machine comes up with a picture of Pinky, so then Brain creates a smart machine and turns Pinky into a genius. However, the new smart Pinky's personality doesn't change at all, which could be a clue to his hidden intelligence. Smart Pinky then finds an error in Brain's calculations and finds that the real reason Brain's plans always fail are actually just due to Brain himself. And actually, Pinky successfully gains control of the world and then hands it over to Brain, but then he messes it up. So how does this theory hold up? A lot of the time, Pinky sees the flaws in Brain's plans, and even though he blames Pinky for their backfiring, 
A lot of the times it's Brain's own fault when they fail. It's pretty clear that Brain is actually incompetent when it comes to being an evil genius. Has Pinky actually been hiding his smarts all along? Who knows? I have yet to find anything to disprove this theory. So on the plausibility meter, I give the Pinky and the Brain conspiracy four weird rodents out of five. The star of Pixar's Academy Award winning film, Wally, is an adorable little robot with a love for Hello Dolly and hoarding trash. But what if this lovable cyborg was actually a cannibal who killed off his other robot counterparts? So here's the theory. The Earth Recovery Act was going perfectly fine until one Wally unit went rogue. Instead of disposing of the garbage, he collected it. The other Wally units disposed of all of the garbage even the things this particular unit wanted to keep. So this rogue unit began destroying all of the other robots and cannibalized their parts until there weren't any others left. The parts he collected allowed him to keep performing long past his operational lifespan for 700 years. I know what you're thinking. How could this adorable little robot become a merciless cyborg cannibal? Well, supposedly in the movie, we see tons of cannibalistic acts performed by our protagonist. He takes the trends off of a fallen comrade without a second thought. He hoards the pieces of his deceased counterparts in his trailer, along with the other pieces of junk he had to protect from the other Wally units. So could this conspiracy be true? Honestly, this theory is pretty hard to believe. Wally's main motive throughout the film is a desire to find an emotional connection with other robots it far outweighs his attachment to trash hoarding. We can see this when Eve takes the plant he found. He never misses the plant, he only misses Eve. But if the emotional appeal isn't working for you, check out some of this logic. Some of the humans were still on Earth when they determined that the cleanup had failed, as shown in the president's last video from Earth. They didn't say exactly why it had failed besides vaguely stating that the job was too big. And I think if there was a rogue Wally destroying all of the other units, they would have told the Axiom to check the firmware on the wall A's for problems. Director Andrew Stanton said in an interview with Yahoo, what if mankind had to leave Earth and they forgot to turn the last robot off? From this, we can assume the president realized that the Earth was beyond repair and they decided to shut all the units off but somehow Wally didn't get affected. You can still think that Wally went rogue and destroyed all of the other robots, but the director's statement says otherwise. So I'm gonna have to give the Wally conspiracy one cockroach out of five. I know one thing's for sure. I'm definitely glad I don't live in a city where this guy is on the police force. Now before we begin, I have to add that this conspiracy has nothing to do with the live action movie. I know, I know, we all love Matthew Broderick. So get this, is Inspector Gadget really the evil Dr. Claw? Inspector Gadget was an Inspector Clouseau meets Robocop cyborg policeman that graced our Saturday morning cartoon lineup in the 80s. But this is what one conspiracy states. Dr. Claw, Inspector Gadget's arch nemesis, is actually the real Inspector Gadget. The main character of the Inspector Gadget series is actually a robot duplicate of the man Dr. Claw once was. The man he used to be was in a terrible explosion while on the job, causing his friends and family to think him dead. This is where his clever niece Penny comes in. In her grief, she recreated her uncle as a crime-fighting robot, not knowing that her real uncle was still alive. Now Claw wants revenge on the machine that replaced him. If you really think about it, this theory fills in a lot of the gaps that the show left out. We never see Claw face and all we know him by is a metal hand and a garbage disposal like voice. So could this really be true? Well, this seems to pan out pretty well. Oh, but there's one thing I forgot. Six years after the show went off the air, they actually released a Dr. Claw action figure that was more than just a metal hand and a chair. They even put a sticker over his face so you couldn't see his face unless you bought the toy. And if you did buy it, you got to see this. Yeah, that's not Inspector Gadget. Who is that guy? In fact, they also showed this same face in the Inspector Gadget Super Nintendo game released in 1993 and the iPhone game that was released last year. It sounds like a really cool theory, but there's just too much that disproves it. So I guess I'm gonna have to give the Inspector Gadget Dr. Claw Conspiracy one claw out of five. I mean, I don't 
remember it personally, but it seems to me like the 70s were a pretty groovy time. Especially since the greatest group of detectives around was a bunch of teenagers and their talking dog. But does Scooby-Doo actually take place during an extreme economic depression? Did you ever wonder why the gang always seemed to end up in abandoned mansions, castles, warehouses, golf courses, ski resorts, and amusement parks? Well, according to this theory, this is all because of an extreme economic depression. And as a technical note, this conspiracy refers solely to the original Scooby-Doo Where Are You series that aired from 1969 to 1970. Not the Scooby-Doo TV movies, not What's New Scooby-Doo, not Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo, and not even the live-action Scooby-Doo movies with Sarah Michelle Gellar. This depression was so bad that even those with highly respectable positions, like Lloyd professors, museum curators, and even celebrities were forced into a life of crime. Now this could explain why their evil plans were so intricate. Not just any criminal could have those super realistic monster costumes or high-tech hideouts complete with holograms. So do you think this conspiracy could really be true? In the original Scooby-Doo Where Are You series, three of the villains had PhDs, two of them were lawyers, and one of them even had the ability to produce a near identical forged painting. Those are skills that in our world would earn you a pretty nice salary, but apparently not in Scooby's universe. Out of the 27 villains Scooby and the gang encounters in the two seasons of Scooby-Doo Where Are You, 23 of them were in it just to steal money. But also bear in mind that this is, believe it or not, a children's show. So of course, the mystery gang isn't going to be busting any murders or meth labs in their psychedelic van. This theory seems to pan out pretty well. Just one historical note though. In 1969 and 1970, the United States economy was doing pretty well. And we could say that maybe Scooby-Doo takes place in another universe, but in the Scooby-Doo TV movies that aired just after the original series ended, there are guest appearances from Don Knotts, The Three Stooges, The Monkees, and even the Harlem Globetrotters. I'm getting in too deep here. I think the depression theory explains a lot, even if it's not perfect. So on the plausibility meter, I give the Scooby-Doo conspiracy four Scooby snacks out of five. Growing up, Hey Arnold was probably one of my favorite shows of all time. And Arnold seemed like the coolest kid ever. But did you guys ever wonder why we never saw Arnold's parents? What if Arnold's grandparents were actually his real parents? Well, this theory states that Arnold's grandparents are actually his biological parents. And since they had him at an older age, Arnold was born with a condition called and I'm probably gonna butcher this, hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is a medical condition that causes a buildup of water in the brain, causing it to swell. And this is apparently what gives Arnold his football-shaped head. Yay. So, genetic mutation or clever character design? Fear not, this conspiracy is totally messed up. In the episode Parents' Day, we clearly see Arnold's parents. We even hear a story about how Arnold was born and exactly why his parents aren't living with him at the moment. They're in South America helping a tribe of mountain people. Also, Nickelodeon planned a sequel movie to Hey Arnold where they go on a field trip to South America and he finds his parents. But unfortunately, it was canceled due to a drop in viewers. Plus, in an interview with the unofficial Hey Arnold site, Creator Craig Bartlett said that he created the character of Arnold when he was doing claymation for Pee Wee's Playhouse. He cut out a football shape from a big sheet of clay, set the eyes wide apart, gave him big hair, and a tiny hat. So Arnold doesn't have hydrocephalus. It's just a shape Craig cut out of clay. So due to all this hard evidence, I'm gonna have to give the Hey Arnold conspiracy 0.5 Arnold heart lockets out of five. Now is it just me, or does it sometimes seem that regular show definitely isn't for kids? Now for this rather trippy conspiracy, I asked my friend Chad to help me out. Yeah, sentient hot dog people, a talking gumball machine, ostriches playing baseball. Is regular show just one big acid trip? 
This theory stems from J.G. Quintel's short film, Two in the AMPM, which is about two guys who accidentally take LSD while working at a gas station convenience store. <laughs> what? Acid? In their hallucinations, they turn into a giant anthropomorphic blue jay and a talking gumball machine. The short ends with the two still tripping, but this theory proposes that Mordecai and Benson became addicted to acid and the result? is the entire series of regular show. Their constant drug abuse would lead to several mental illnesses, such as multiple personality disorder and schizophrenia. Their friends and co-workers are just figments of their drug-induced imagination. This drug addiction would actually explain their terrible choices in food, video games, music, basically anything in the show. In fact, the park they work in isn't even real. The alleged park is supposedly an abandoned house that Benson and Mordecai live in. The theory goes on further to say that Skips, the wise old ape man, is actually Mordecai's drug supplier, and every piece of advice he gives Mordecai is something that he experienced while he was on acid. Pops is a shady crime lord who plays naive to get away with things, which I believe is a defense used by Suge Knight for several years. Benson is a shady sheriff who lets Pops get away with him do whatever he wants. Muscle Man and High Five Ghosts are actually stoners, and Innocent Margaret is an ex-girlfriend of Mordecai, who he used to suspect was cheating on him. And Rigby well, Rigby is Mordecai's dead best friend, who died when they were both 15, which explains why they're always hanging out together and why they're always acting like teenagers. Rigby is essentially a ghost, dragging Mordecai down and keeping him from growing emotionally. So is acid really the answer for regular show's crazy antics? To start, let's look at Two in the AMPM, which is a senior film done by J.G. Quintel, the show's creator, while he was studying at Cal Arts, while also working on Flapjack at Cartoon Network, which is a pretty cool side job to have. Cut to two years later, and Cartoon Network is looking for a few shows that are a bit more PG. J.G. takes his original short, adds a few characters, changes the backstory, and then you have the pilot for regular show. So besides the character designs for Mordecai and Benson, there isn't necessarily any connection between his short film and the actual series. And because regular show is PG, I don't think there are going to be any LSD references. But the show is trippy enough that I can't prove this theory entirely false. So on the plausibility meter, I give the regular show conspiracy two and a half baby ducks out of five. Disney's female leads might sometimes seem pretty visually similar, but what if there's more to that than just a design choice? So is this just another instance of Disney's unoriginal character designs, or could it be something more? Do you think Jane could be Belle's great-great-granddaughter? I can understand where this theory came from, because it's pretty hard to ignore the physical similarities between Jane and Belle. They both have brown hair that they tend to pull back, and they both seem to wear yellow dresses. They also both have eccentric fathers, a desire for adventure, a taste in slightly wild men, and then a determination for fixing those men. In Tarzan, we also get a cameo appearance from the dishware formerly known as Chip and Mrs. Potts. It's possible that all of this runs in the family. But what connects the daughter of a French inventor to the daughter of a British professor? Bet you didn't guess it's the Duke of Weaseltown from Frozen. Uh, it's pronounced Wesselton. You know, he does look very similar to Jane's father, Professor Q. Porter, but how exactly are they related? Beauty and the Beast seems to be set between the mid to late 1700s, based off the original story, and Frozen is set in the mid 1800s. We're assuming the Duke is German based on his pronunciation of certain words, but how is a German Duke related to the grandson of a French prince? Well, for answers, let's look at everyone's favorite topic, the French Revolution. Belle and the Beast could have fled to Germany, where they would have been financially well off enough to win favor with the German nobility. This history would actually explain why the Duke is scared of sorcery, because his grandfather was cursed. The legend of his grandfather's curse would have been passed down through his family, which also means there would have been a wonderful moment when the Duke would have sat down with his father and said, Son, let me tell you the story about the time your grandfather was a bear pig man. So when the Duke lost trade with Arundel, he would have seen opportunity in the British Industrial Revolution. And as a resourceful businessman, he did well enough that his grandson became a professor, while also weirdly subconsciously interested in the study of giant hairy monsters. For a family that had gone from rags to riches across all of Europe multiple times, you'd understand why their descendants would be adventurous, adaptable, and able to understand people who don't really speak their language. This theory sounds so cool, but unfortunately it seems to fall apart pretty quickly. 
It makes sense that Frozen takes place around the mid-1800s. If you look at Hans's uniform, they're based off of Napoleonic and early post-Napoleonic era, which is around 1830 to 1850. So then when does Beauty and the Beast take place? Disney was heavily influenced by the original French fairy tale, which was published between 1740 and 1760. So we can assume that the film takes place somewhere in the mid-1700s. But this is where the theory makes its downfall. During the song Be Our Guest, the dishware, apparently thinking being living dishware isn't oppressive enough, form a construct of the Eiffel Tower. But the Eiffel Tower wasn't built until the late 1880s. So if it's said in the late 1880s, how would a Belle's grandson be able to go back in time to visit Elsa and Anna in Arendelle? This is excellent fan fiction, it's just too bad history got in the way. Once again, history, the worst. So on the plausibility meter, I have to give the Frozen plus Beauty and the Beast plus Tarzan world theory a 3 out of 5 anthropomorphic dishwares out of 5. Oh, Halloween time. A time for pumpkin spice everything, black hats, ghosts, witches, and that great Charlie Brown special about a homicidal, alien-possessed pumpkin. Wait, what? Gather round, kitties, and I'll tell you a creepy tale. On one Hallow's Eve, after all the trick-or-treating and all the kids were sound asleep, above the clouds, an unforeseen horror was approaching. Out in the great pumpkin patches, an asteroid containing an evil alien species crash lands. The alien finds the closest thing and possesses it. You guessed it, a pumpkin. The insatiable gourd lusted for human flesh and proceeded to go on a killing rampage in the nearest town. Since all of the children were safe and sound in their beds, the alien went after all of the adults. The next morning, the children awoke to see all of the carnage left behind. The scene was so intense that everyone managed to black it out of their minds. Except for one kid, Linus. So Linus has to sacrifice one of his friends to the Great Pumpkin every year so their community can live in peace. Pretty spooky, right? Now this could explain why he convinces Lucy to wait for the Great Pumpkin with him with the promise of gifts and toys. Plus, at the beginning of the TV special, Linus is sickened when Lucy begins to cut a hole in one of the pumpkins. This shows that Linus thinks pumpkins are alive. So where are all of the adults? We hear something talk to them when they're at school, but that doesn't sound like a person. So have we been deceived by the great pumpkin? Look, don't be scared. I'm going to show you why this conspiracy doesn't make the cut. The reason the teachers make that noise in the show was actually an artistic decision by Charles Schultz. In the comic strip, the adults are never seen to make sure that the kids are the main focus. So when they started to make the animated series, Schultz wanted to make sure that idea translated. So that's where we get that trumpet noise from. It's my turn next. Here's my first word of the spelling bee. <laughs> Failure? Yes, ma'am. That's an easy one. Charles Schultz went on to say that he had no clear motivation for The Great Pumpkin, besides the fact that he wanted one of the kids to get Halloween confused with Christmas. This is more of a holidays than anything else. Plus, The Great Pumpkin never even comes. Good grief. But this theory is pretty scary, so in the spirit of Halloween, I'm going to give The Great Pumpkin Theory three rocks out of five. Today on Cartoon Conspiracy, we're gonna do something a little different. We're here on location in the happiest place on earth with fellow Disney connoisseur, Sarah Stitch. And today we're here to get to the bottom of some of the craziest facts and fiction about Disneyland. Disneyland's address is 1313 Harbor Way. Sounds creepy, right? Well, M is actually the 13th letter in the alphabet, so MM actually stands for Mickey Mouse. Main Street USA was designed to resemble the center of a turn-of-the-century American town, based on Walt's hometown, Marceline, Missouri. Here on Main Street, you can buy anything from decorative caramel apples to Disneyland merchandise. But at one point, you could also buy lingerie and cigars. Where the Crystal Art Shop stands today was once home to the Wizard of Bras, and this Native American statue is the last remnant of the tobacco shop that was open until 1991. Did you know that Walt built himself an apartment inside the park so that he could stay and enjoy it with his family? It's right above the fire station, and while it's no longer in use, a light is kept on to honor him. Sleeping Beauty Castle actually has a working drawbridge, but it's only been used twice. Once at the park's opening in 1955, and again at the reopening of Fantasyland in 1983. 
Until the Tower of Terror was built in 2004, the Matterhorn was the tallest peak in the city of Anaheim. But did you know that in this to scale model of the famous Alp, there is an actual basketball court? Due to the building codes in Anaheim, in order for a structure to be that tall, it had to be labeled an athletic complex. Have you ever wondered how cast members and face characters get around the park without being seen? Rumor is that there is a series of underground tunnels and rooms. And while this is not the case for Disneyland, it's actually true in Disney World. So we can all agree that Disneyland is probably the most magical place on the planet. And part of that magical illusion comes from Disney's own colors of green paint. Go away green and no see em green. They paint things these colors when they want them to blend into the background. One of the best kept secrets in Disneyland is Walt's very own secret lounge called Club 33. Walt created Club 33 as a VIP lounge for Disneyland's investors. Up until 2012, only a select number of people were allowed in the club, but when the list opened up again, new members could pay an initiation fee of 27 grand and get put on a waiting list of 14 years. But it might be worth it, because Club 33 is the only place inside of Disneyland that serves alcohol. Around the holidays, the Haunted Mansion is taken over by characters from Nightmare Before Christmas, but the rest of the year, it's haunted by silly spooks. Except, it might literally be haunted. Rumor has it that in the 70s, a family spread the ashes of their deceased son on the ride. I mean, if I had to spend the rest of eternity haunting somewhere, I'd like it to be Disneyland. Disneyland is home to a lot of animals. Goats, horses, ducks, and even cats. <coughs> instead of hiring an exterminator to handle any rodent problems, Disneyland instead employs hundreds of feral cats to wander the parks after closing and do a little pest control. As if they couldn't stick Mickey Mouse in enough places throughout the park, Imagineers have hidden hundreds of hidden Mickeys across the resort. Some are pretty obvious, while others are very sneaky. Probably one of the biggest Disneyland conspiracies out there is the location of Walt Disney's supposedly cryogenically frozen head, foot, nose, body, whatever. Some say it's under the castle, others think it's buried under the hub, and some even think it's in the Matterhorn. What do we think? I would like to give just a big pat on the back to the Disney fandom for creating a conspiracy for a movie that has just barely been released. This conspiracy was actually sent to me by a viewer named DJ, and it was way too crazy to pass up. So, how are Disney's Big Hero 6, Frozen, Tangled, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and Bolt all connected? You may have noticed a wanted poster of Hans in the police station of San Francisco. That's where this conspiracy theory begins. It's been pretty obvious that since Disney switched over to CG animation that all of their female characters look exactly the same. And it's apparently a well-documented fact that all Disney female characters must reproduce asexually via mitosis. And supposedly it is absolutely canon that Rapunzel is a cousin of Anna and Elsa from Frozen. And from there, the conspiracy states that Big Hero 6's Honey Lemon is the asexually reproduced daughter of Rapunzel, Gogo Tamago is the daughter of Elsa, and Aunt Cass is the daughter of Anna because they all look so alike. We can also assume that Frozen and The Little Mermaid take place in the same universe because the sunken ship at the beginning of The Little Mermaid is that of Anna and Elsa's parents. Also that The Little Mermaid and Aladdin take place in the same universe because of Sebastian's quick cameo. And here's where the actual conspiracy begins. After Hans is arrested in Arendelle, he's sent to prison in Agrabah where he finds the genie's lamp. He uses it to transport himself to the year 2032 and kidnaps the daughters of the three cousins. Hans then tries to ransom off the girls to Rapunzel's great, 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 great granddaughter Penny, who we can also assume exists in this universe because a photo of her dog Balt can also be seen on the police officer's desk. When his ransom doesn't work, Hans goes into hiding as the kabuki mask villain Yokai and kills Tadashi, the great 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 grandson of Kristoff. So is this Disneyverse theory really true? Where exactly is it well documented that all Disney princesses asexually reproduce? I mean, we all know how mermaids reproduce and it's super gross, but Erla was a human when she had Melody, and Melody would also have some of her father Eric's genetics. And that still doesn't explain Rapunzel, Anna, or Elsa. I'll contradict myself a little bit and believe that Anna and Elsa really are the cousins of Rapunzel, 
and that Frozen and Little Mermaid really do take place in the same universe. And all right, I'll even buy that Aladdin and the Little Mermaid take place in the same universe. And so maybe Hans's brothers banished him to a prison all the way in the fictional Middle East, hundreds of years after the events of Aladdin, which is like, harsh. I'll buy this conspiracy up until the point that Hans travels to the future to ransom off the daughters of the princesses, because I have a little bit of a problem with that part. How are we to know that Tadashi is related to Kristoff? I mean, I know they look a lot alike, but are we supposed to assume that all men also asexually reproduce? How does the world exist then? Actually, let's go back to the asexual reproduction thing, because that's what's really bothering me about this theory. I'm definitely not a biology expert here, but last time I checked, I'm pretty sure these girls aren't fungi or giant bacteria, so I don't think they can actually reproduce asexually. Of course I don't think this conspiracy is canon at all. Like the Frozen Tangled theory, the Frozen Tarzan theory, and even the Frozen Beauty and the Beast theory, this one relies solely on Easter eggs and really creative fan fiction. I'm definitely not gonna give it a five, but I also don't wanna give it a zero. So I'm gonna give this conspiracy a gold you tried star. So I was up late at night watching cartoons, eating a jar of peanut butter, which is a pretty typical Saturday night for me, and I had a terrifying thought. What if Tailspin, the cartoon about bears flying planes, is actually a terrifying sequel to The Jungle Book about animals taking over the world. Our first piece of evidence is the song from The Jungle Book called I Wanna Be Like You. If you haven't heard it in a while, you're like, oh yeah, it's about a bear dancing with monkeys in a grass skirt, it's super cute. No, in fact, it is about a monkey king declaring his intentions to become like mankind and take their power for a higher empire. Also, it's in the ruins of like an ancient civilization, which is also just creepy as hell. In the song, King Louis states that he wishes to walk like a human, I wanna walk like you, talk like a human, talk like you, and he also expresses a disappointment that he feels like he's stuck at the current ring of the animal food chain. He wants to have mankind's fire and their power to ascend to a new, higher level. And be just like the other men. I'm tired of walking around. So what if after the events of Jungle Book, King Louis actually succeeded and got some of mankind's power and then took over all of humanity? And then instead of just getting fire, they got planes and buildings and tacky Hawaiian shirts. After this mass genocide of the human race, they decided to build a town in a place called Crepe Suzette, which is a fun wordplay of a French word for a dessert called a Crepe Suzette, which is wordplay that no kid will get or appreciate. There, Baloo opened up a plane delivery service called Hire for Hire, run by a female bear named Rebecca, who I think is supposed to be attractive, but it's hard to tell because she's a bear, and found a sidekick in the sky surfing bear named Kit, which I think is also physically impossible. Meanwhile, King Louie opens up a bar, because why not, and Shere Khan, well, Shere Khan is a tough businessman running Khan Enterprises. Is it Shere Khan or Shere, I never, Shere Khan. Shere Khan, okay. The only one missing is Bagheera, which is a little weird because he's such a main character in the Jungle Book, but maybe he actually existed and just passed away in the Great War. Oh yeah, the Great War! That's a thing, that's canon. In the episode Bygones, Blue references a thing called the Great War, which ended 20 years ago. While we don't know exactly what the Great War is, it definitely could be an animal uprising. In Tailspin, Baloo's name is actually Baloo von Bearwald the 13th, which translates to mean he is the 13th in a long line of bears from the Brown Forest. Before I start poking holes in my own wonderful theory, let me tell you some fun facts about Tailspin. Do you know that two episodes of Tailspin are banned? Well, one permanently banned and one only temporarily banned. The first episode was called Lost Horizons and was supposedly stereotyping Asian culture. Tisk tisk. The second episode was called Flying Dupes and was temporarily banned for having references to terrorism. Fun animals committing acts of terrorism. Also, did you know that Tailspin was nominated for an Emmy in 1991? Or that Tailspin is spelled T-A-L-E, even though it should totally be T-A-I-L because it's about animals with tails and T-A-I-L is the, the appropriate term for planes. It's very confusing. There are a few holes in my theory thanks to the behind the scenes history of the show. In an interview on animationresource.org, one of the show's creators, Jim Magon, admitted that the show was basically a last minute idea. Magon was already working on a show about Baloo and other secondary Disney characters that got rejected. Desperate for an idea, he recalled a plot from an earlier episode of DuckTales he wrote that would give Launchpad McQuack his own air delivery service. He just swapped out the ducks for bears and there you go, tailspin. 
same thing. So Tailspin was definitely a last minute idea, meaning that any characters and their placement in the show, it's really just kind of them filling in the blanks. Like, ah, oh, you got King Louie, sure, he can run the bar. Tigers are businessmen, sure, there you go. So since this is my own personal theory, it seems very unfair for me to rate it. Why don't you in the comments tell me how good this theory is? And it's, it's pretty good, right? It's pretty solid. Bears are scary. Enter at your peril past the vaulted doors where impossible things happen that the world's never seen before. Sound familiar? Dexter's Laboratory was the go-to place if you needed the craziest inventions from robo-suits to time machines. Well, what if one of these inventions actually killed his entire family? Well, as we all know, Dee Dee is always messing up Dexter's inventions. This theory proposes that one time Dee Dee was messing around in the lab, pushed the wrong button, and blew up the house, killing his entire family. Dexter was the only one who survived, and in his grief, he created clones of his entire family. This could also explain why Dexter's parents are so oblivious to the idea of his laboratory behind his bookshelf. He recreated them without the ability to recognize or remember the laboratory. Also, this could explain why in some episodes the family gets blown up or turned into monsters, and by the next episode, they're totally fine. Dexter made his new family impervious to damage to prevent the same thing from happening. We also see that in several episodes, Dexter has the ability to clone things and has also mastered how to control the central nervous system. You know, like the time you put the mind of a dog into a T-Rex. So is Dexter actually just living with clones of his dead family? Now before we start poking holes in the theory, how about some fun facts about Dexter's lab? Do you know there's an episode of Dexter's Lab that has actually been banned because Dexter and Dee Dee say bad words? The episode, entitled Rude Removal, revolved around Dexter and Dee Dee cursing up a storm, and even though it was heavily censored and nothing but b****, it was still removed from the network's lineup. The episode was never mentioned again until 10 years later, where the episode was released on Adult Swim's YouTube channel in 2013. It has since been removed, but, you know, it's the internet. There's places where one could download that. What is with all of these sad conspiracies? Why must some people suck the joy out of cartoons? Okay, so the theory implies that Dexter loved his family enough to clone them. But why is it in that one episode where he gets lost in the supermarket, he wants nothing to do with his family and instead gets mixed up with a kid named Dextor? Or what about that one episode where he asks his parents to help him fight a monster in Japan and at the end of the episode he wipes their memory? Why would he have to wipe their memory if he created them? I mean, it's a pretty good conspiracy, but based on this information, I'm a little skeptical still. So we're gonna have to give the Dexter's Lab conspiracy two handsome Dexters out of five. Y'all know who the original ladies man was. No, it's not George Clooney and it's not Harry Styles. It's not the dashingly handsome Ryan Gosling, and it's not even Ryan Reynolds. Of course, it was Johnny Bravo who was the original. But what if this lady killer was actually just a little kid? Johnny Bravo can't seem to attract anyone of the opposite sex, and this conspiracy states that it's because he's actually a child. So the entirety of the Johnny Bravo series is actually just one little dweeby kid imagining himself as a hunky adult. Let's face it, he acts like a kid, he doesn't have a job, and his body's really weird looking for an adult. I mean, it's possible he just skipped leg day, but look at everybody else in this world. They're pretty normal by cartoon standards. Also, in one episode, he does take a karate class with a bunch of kids. Now this could just be a gag, or it could be how he perceives himself, a super cool adult amongst a bunch of children. And on top of all that, Johnny never actually wants to be in a relationship with women. He just wants to go on a date with them. I don't think a kid has any idea of what actually goes into dating. He never says he wants to get married or anything remotely close to that. So it could be that he's just imagining all of this, or he's just a really, really bad boyfriend. Plus, his only friend is a little girl, and I don't see why some 20-something-year-old dude would want to hang out with an 8-year-old child. On the contrary, though, 
Why would women beat up a kid? Throughout the show, Johnny gets beat up dozens of times. These women would be arrested if Johnny was actually a kid. But according to this theory, Johnny isn't actually being beat up. Because he's exaggerating all of this, he perceives these rejections as physical pain. And how can we forget he calls some of the women he hits on mama? That sounds like something a kid would say if he was trying to hit on older women. Or maybe he's just trying to copy his idol and who the character is based off of, Elvis Presley. Oh, and one last thing. He still lives with his mom. Things aren't looking so good for this ladies man. So could this conspiracy really be true? All right, fun fact time. Did you know that some of the crew from Johnny Bravo went on to make their own cartoons? Two of the biggest names you may recognize are Seth MacFarlane and Butch Hartman. Seth went on to create shows like Family Guy and American Dad, and Butch went on to create Fairly Odd Parents and Danny Phantom. Okay, now back to the business. As adorable as it is to see an eight-year-old kid trying to hit on older women, this theory gets stopped in its tracks by one episode. In The Time of My Life, Johnny actually remembers his high school years. In the episode, Johnny tells Susie about his first crush he had in high school. He talks about how he got all buff for her, but then she moved away and he couldn't take her to prom. Now, why would a kid think of a pretty heartbreaking story like that? Or how would he have memories of high school if he was only eight? Also, I don't think the Scooby-Doo gang would want to have some eight-year-old twerp following them around while they're solving mysteries. So considering all of this, I still think the theory is pretty good, but not perfect. So on the plausibility meter, I give the Johnny Bravo conspiracy three monkeys out of five. One of my favorite things as a kid was Winnie the Pooh. You know, the adventures of a little boy named Christopher Robin and his best friend slash stuffed animal Pooh Bear. Do you know what I mean, Briarly? Oh yeah. Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, tubby little cubby all stuffed with mental disorders. Wait, did you say mental disorders? This theory proposes that Christopher Robin and his animal friends are all diagnosed with various mental disorders. Now for this conspiracy, I asked my good friend and fellow Pooh Bear aficionado, Briarly, to help me out. Thank you, Emily. I'm very glad to be here for this rather unusual story. You see, on December 12, 2000, the Canadian Medical Journal decided to do a little study on our friends in the 100 Acre Wood. Because why not? Their findings are pretty extreme. Let's start with our favorite honey-eating bear, Winnie the Pooh. According to this study, Winnie the Pooh has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, impulsivity with obsessive fixations, and last but not least, obsessive compulsive disorder. Oh bother. <laughs> Little Piglet suffers from generalized anxiety disorder because he's constantly anxious and flustered. Our sad buddy Eeyore suffers from depression. The wonderfully hyper Tigger suffers from hyperactivity impulsivity. Rabbit suffers from OCD since he's always trying to keep everything in order. Owl is dyslexic, which is pretty tame considering the rest. Sadly, Christopher Robin doesn't come out so clean either. But he seems like such a normal kid. He makes believe with his stuffed toys and goes on imaginary adventures with them. You know, kid things. Well, apparently that's wrong. According to the study, based on the complexity of his hallucinations and his delusions of his toys having sentient life, he has, you guessed it, schizophrenia. What is happening to my childhood? Emily, this is making me feel like I should go to therapy. My childhood is a lie. Apparently, the only healthy ones in the group are Kanga and Rue. I mean, sure, she's a little overprotective at times, but what parent wouldn't be scared for their child's life when they're growing up around a gang of troubled youths? I think Heffalumps and Woozles are the least of their problems. But I wonder, do we have to accept the truth of this? Do all of our favorite characters need to be in therapy? The evidence for this conspiracy is pretty impressive, especially considering whoever wrote it decided that the Canadian Medical Association needed to get involved. But how well do the diagnoses really pan out? In several Winnie the Pooh specials, Owl's gotten the gang in a lot of trouble by misreading various signs and notes. Like in Pooh's Grand Adventure, he mistakes the word school for skull. That's a pretty big difference. But Owl is one of the oldest characters in the show, so it's possible that he might just need glasses. On the other hand, Rabbit's neurotic obsession with keeping everything in order and completely losing it when Tigger messes it up are symptoms pretty closely associated to OCD. Hey, in Rabbit's defense, Tigger is a pretty terrible house guest. 
but he does seem to be consumed by his need for order. What about our favorite bear, who, supposedly, has some pretty serious conditions, ADHD, OCD, impulsivity with obsessive fixations. Anyone familiar with the show knows that Pooh's obsession with honey often drives him to the point of carelessness, risking himself and his friends to get it. He is often forgetful and doesn't always listen to what his friends say. I don't know the exact specifications for this disorder, but that doesn't sound healthy to me. Still, we have to remember that Pooh is a bear, and bears aren't exactly known for their impulse control. So, what about the rest of the gang? Well, Piglet must have generalized anxiety disorder. He's constantly shaking and has an unrealistic fear of everything. Like when he compares falling out of bed to falling 10,000 feet into jagged rocks. I mean, some days I feel the same way, but I'm not that dramatic about it. You know what? A low dosage of Xanax might help the little guy out. Now, Tigger's constant bouncing and jumping around can obviously be seen as a symptom of ADHD. He has all of this pent-up energy and is unable to focus, so he's literally bouncing off the walls. On the other side of the spectrum, Eeyore's poor outlook on life can be due to his depression. I mean, the poor guy eats thistles for food and lives in a pile of sticks. I don't know guys, there's an awful lot of evidence to this conspiracy. Sadly, I have to agree. It's pretty rock solid. Yet I find comfort in the fact that the creator, Alan Alexander Mill, never actually said that his characters had any of these disorders. On the other hand, just because ADHD wasn't necessarily diagnosed in the 1800s doesn't mean it didn't exist. Still, without any confirmation from the creator, who can't really give confirmation at this point, we can't give it a perfect score. So while this should be a rock solid theory, we're gonna have to give it four and a half heffalumps out of five. Have you guys ever wondered why that Timmy Turner kid from The Fairly Odd Parents looks so much like Danny Phantom? No? Seriously? Come on, Brizzy, back me up here. Gladly. Come on, guys. They both have similar hair, thick eyebrows, blue eyes, even their parents look and act similar. Plus, they both like to jump into different dimensions. So we're wondering, is it possible that Timmy Turner grew up to be Danny Phantom? We all know Timmy Turner has fairy godparents that grant his every wish and take him to and from their home dimension, Fairy World. But sadly, Timmy knows that when he turns 13, he loses his fairy godparents in every single memory that they ever existed. Distraught by the thought of losing his two best friends, Timmy makes a reckless wish before his 13th birthday. He wishes that he, Cosmo, and Wanda know each other when he's older. You know, at the ripe old age of 14 years old. Unfortunately, that wish is against the rules for Timmy, so instead he wishes to become someone else completely. Someone more interesting, wiser, and cooler. Speaking of someone cooler... Ah, this is much better. Where was I? Oh, yes, so just before Timmy's 13th birthday, his fairy godparents turn him into Danny Fenton, a 14-year-old living in Amity Park with his ghost-chasing parents and sister Jazz. Due to Timmy wanting to be a totally different person, the world changed around him as well. Fairy World transforms into Ghost Zone, and while he still has his parents, they've transformed into bizarro versions of themselves. Speaking of different versions, the whole point of Timmy's wish is to keep Cosmo and Wanda in his life. And it works! But the Fairy Council is aware that the rules have been bent, so they make Cosmo and Wanda forget Timmy as well. And as a result, he's not sure who they are now. Could Frostbite the lovable snowman be Cosmo? And where did Jazz come from? Could she be Wanda? Timmy can't be sure, but he does know they're still in his life. Also, check out this comparison of characters. Trixie becomes Paulina, AJ becomes Tucker, Tootie becomes Sam, and Chester becomes Dash. With so much chaos and coincidence, could there be any truth to this theory? Okay, so this theory is super cool. If it's true, Timmy slash Danny is living the coolest possible life ever. Fairy godparents in his childhood, and ghostly superhero in his teens. But let's look a little closer. First of all, both shows were created by the same guy, Butch Hartman, so that explains the similar character design. Secondly, and more damaging, in the Fairly Odd Parents episode Polter Geeks, Danny Phantom makes a cameo in the background. This could mean that Danny Phantom and Timmy Turner live in the same universe at the same time. If that's the case, how could they possibly be the same person? That's true. If Danny really does exist, the Fairy Council wouldn't allow wishes that give his life to Timmy. But what if we view the Danny Phantom cameo as a foreshadowing of things to come? Then this conspiracy 
could work. For example, we've seen on several occasions that Timmy would do anything to keep Cosmo and Wanda, so a reckless witch like this doesn't seem that out of the ordinary. Also, the similar personalities of characters in both shows is pretty conspicuous. For example, in the Fairly Odd Parents episode Poultry Geeks, Timmy's parents become Ghostbusters. Would it really be such a stretch for them to become real ghost hunters in Danny Phantom? Interesting point, Emily. There are a lot of similarities. But if this is true, why would Timmy's wish also make everyone grow an extra finger? Part of me really wants to believe this theory, but it's a little hard to accept. This whole concept is full of loose coincidences. I'm gonna give this conspiracy a 1.5 floaty crowny things out of 5. Well, I think this conspiracy is a lot of fun and still holds a lot of ground, so I'm gonna give it 4 box ghosts out of five. Now I'm not wearing this ridiculous hat just for the heck of it, so it must be Christmas time. So pour yourself a cup of eggnog and gather around because I'm going to tell you about the most spectacular reindeer. You know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a very shiny nose and could also be a girl. This theory states that our buddy from the 1964 Rankin and Bass TV special, Rudolph, is actually a girl. And according to the author of this conspiracy, our answers lie within our good friend, science. Allegedly, a female reindeer's nose actually glows red when it attracts a male. As we scoured across the internet to try and disprove this theory, we actually found more scientific proof. Our protagonist, Rudolph, has antlers for the majority of the film. but. Male reindeers actually don't grow antlers in the winter time. Males shed their antlers in the autumn during mating season. It's the females that shed their antlers in the spring and grow them back just in time for winter. Which would mean Rudolph wouldn't have antlers sticking out of his head during Christmas. Unless he were a girl. So is our sleigh guiding pal actually a girl? So let's talk reindeer science. Okay. Well, first of all, reindeer's noses do actually glow, but it can only really be seen under a thermal camera. When reindeers are looking for food in the snow, their noses are exposed to really low temperatures. So in order to keep them warm, extra blood flows to the nose, giving it that reddish glow. But it doesn't just glow for females. Males have this as well. But also consider this, and it may get a little weird. If Rudolph wasn't a girl, the only other possible outcome is that he was eunuch. Yep, you heard me right. Reindeers can become eunuch. All of this is really cool and a little gross. This theory makes quite a lot of sense and you know I can't argue with science or nature. So in the spirit of Christmas, I give the Rudolph conspiracy four elves who want to be dentists out of five. Water, earth, fire, air. Long ago, the four nations lived in harmony. And I think you probably know where this is going. I don't know about you guys, but I love Avatar The Last Airbender. But if you've never seen the show, first of all, get on that. And second of all, here's a little synopsis. In this fictional universe, the world is divided into four nations based on the four elements, earth, water, fire, and air. Some people are given the gift of bending an element, which is sort of like an earthy superpower. Those people are called benders. Every generation, one person is naturally chosen to yield the power of all four elements. This person is called the Avatar, and they act as sort of an ambassador between the four nations. Well, if you're really set on watching the series and you haven't seen it before, here is your spoiler warning. Right now. This is it. Stop watching the video. Come back at another time. All good now? If you're familiar with the show, you know that before the spin-off series, The Legend of Korra, Aang passed away, which restarted the Avatar cycle. But what if he didn't actually die, and Aang is still alive? This theory states that instead of Aang passing away at an old age, he instead just lost his ability to bend. It proposes that Aang went up against Amon, or somebody like him, and during the battle, his bending was either blocked or taken away completely. And because the Avatar is chosen by a natural cycle that runs through all four elemental nations, the cycle just decided to move on to the next viable candidate instead of waiting for him to die. If this was true, this could mean that due to his lack of bending, he felt inadequate to his followers and decided to exile himself, leaving the world to think him dead. So could Aang really still be out there? As much as I wish Aang was still alive, and I really, really wish he was still alive, 
I don't think this conspiracy holds up. Okay, we have to remember that at the end of the first series, Aang learned how to take away another bender's power through something called energy bending. And in Legend of Korra, we learn there's another form of bending severance. But Amon never actually took the bending away. Instead, he used a form of blood bending to sever the bender from their ability to bend. The art of energy bending came long before the Avatar and before the creation of the Four Nations. Before any of this, it was the lion turtles that bent the elemental energy within the humans and themselves. Eventually, when the humans were given the ability to bend the elements, the art of energy bending was almost lost completely, except for the lion turtles. By Avatar Aang's time, only one lion turtle still survived, and that was the last remnant of energy bending. It was this lion turtle that imparted the knowledge of energy bending onto Aang. Therefore, Aang is the only human in his generation and those past it that we know of who can truly take bending away from a bender. So it wouldn't really make sense for Aang to be severed and for the Avatar cycle to start anew if his powers weren't truly taken away by energy bending. The only possible way this theory could pan out is if. When Aang was trying to remove the bending from Yakon, Amon's father, or someone like him, the energy bending backfired and his soul was corrupted. However, not much is really known about energy bending in the Avatar universe, so I can't really make any confirmations here. While I personally doubt that Aang could still be alive, I still think this theory holds a lot of grounds. But I can't really give it a perfect score. So based on all this evidence, I give the Avatar The Last Airbender Conspiracy 3.5 Flying Bisons out of 5. Evil witches seem pretty popular in the Disney universe. Let's just list some. There's Ursula, Maleficent, Madame Mim, Mother Gothel, and the Evil Queen from Snow White. Wait, what if the Evil Queen from Snow White and Mother Gothel are the same person? The theory is pretty simple. It states that the Evil Queen didn't actually plunge to her death at the end of Snow White and instead moved far away and created the new identity of Mother Gothel from the movie Tangled. So let's look at this theory and dissect it piece by piece. Well, for starters, they're both obsessed with staying young and beautiful. So obsessed that they're willing to do anything to keep their youthful appearance. One is willing to get rid of anyone who happens to be fairer than she, and the other kidnapped a princess and kept her locked in a tower to exploit her hair for its magical powers. Also, they look pretty darn similar when they're young and old. Plus, they both seem to have a thing for daggers. Do you think that Mother Gothel's dagger could possibly be the same one the Evil Queen gave to the Huntsman to kill Snow White? So do you think Mother Gothel and the Evil Queen could really be the same person? In an interview, Tangle directors Nathan Greno and Byron Howard said that Mother Gothel's design was heavily inspired by both Lady Tremaine from Cinderella and the Evil Queen from Snow White. So Mother Gothel and the Evil Queen purposely share a lot of similarities. But let's get to the conspiracy. All right, well for starters, let's talk about the individual movies. Snow White is set in the 1500s in a fictional kingdom that's probably in Germany based on the original Brothers Grimm fairy tale. Tangled was set somewhere between the late 1700s and the early 1800s in the fictional kingdom of Corona, which was heavily inspired by Eastern German, Polish, and Hungarian influences. Now, although both movies take place about 300 years apart, they're still relatively close geographically. So it's not completely unbelievable that our evil queen character fled Snow White's kingdom and found the magic flower in Corona. But let's look at their daggers, because the conspiracy relies pretty heavily on that. While both women do yield daggers, they have very different handles. So it's a little hard to believe that they would be the same one. And another huge flaw in this conspiracy. Besides using the magic of the flower that already existed, Mother Gothel never seems to use any magic of her own, unlike the Queen from Snow White. If Gothel really was a witch, why wouldn't she just put Rapunzel to sleep like she did with Snow White and just use her for her hair? Just saying. But I think the biggest fault in this conspiracy is the Evil Queen's death at the end of Snow White. She fell off of a cliff, which usually leaves some ambiguity for survival. But the vultures came after her and kind of began to circle above her. So by cartoon standards, that means she's definitely dead. So I'm gonna have to give the Mother Gothel Evil Queen Conspiracy three huntsmen out of five. Hey 
Hey guys, filling in for me this week is my good friend Sapphire from Toon Buzz. She's going to be covering a super sarcastic conspiracy. So I hope you enjoy and I'll see you guys next week. Oh great, another theory thought up by people who'd rather find meaning in fictional cartoons than meaning in their own lives. Daria Morgendorfer, my spirit animal, is the sarcastic and misanthropic teenager from the 90s MTV series Daria. She's too much of a brain to fit in with her vapid high school classmates, and she's nothing like her popular sister Quinn, overachieving mom Helen, and neurotic dad Jake. But what if that's because she really isn't a Morgendorfer? Throughout the series, Quinn consistently refers to Daria as her cousin or something. We assume that's because Quinn is too embarrassed to admit that that weird girl is actually her sister, but what if she isn't lying? And that Daria's real mom is Aunt Amy. The theory states that Aunt Amy got pregnant at a time when she couldn't raise a child, and since her older sister Helen was already married and a well-off suburbanite, she offered to adopt Daria and raise her as her own. Amy moved a few hours away, and they all agreed to keep this a secret from Daria. Amy first makes an appearance in the episode I Don't, and from the second she arrives, she starts throwing bitingly honest remarks at everybody, in a very Daria-like fashion. In that same episode, Daria makes a joke that she's in the witness protection program, and that the Morgendorfers were kind enough to take her in. So, is Daria really the cynical spawn of Aunt Amy? Despite having really similar personalities, I don't think there's enough evidence to prove that Aunt Amy is Daria's real mom. I mean, if Helen was kind enough to help Amy out when she needed her, you would think she wouldn't speak so poorly of her and call her a tightly wound pain in the ass. And in the episode Lucky Strike, there is a very heartfelt moment when Quinn unashamedly admits that Daria is in fact her real sister. I think Amy's purpose in the series is to prove that Daria is related to these people. It's not uncommon for kids to share more traits with family members outside of their immediate family. I mean, I'm nothing like my parents. Wait. Because of its lack of evidence, I give this sick sad theory one pizza slice. Well, dudes and dudettes, for this episode, our writers were on a mission. We're here to find out the answer to this question. Could Tito be the biological father of Reggie and Otto from Rocket Power? So this theory states that the lovable pudgy Hawaiian man Tito is actually the father of Reggie and Otto. When Raimundo was married to his wife Danielle, she actually had an affair with Tito. Ooh. This could explain why Reggie and Otto always call Raimundo by his first name instead of dad. Also, this could be why Tito stays and works for Raimundo at his diner for close to nothing, just so he could be close to his kids. Plus, he also shares stories about his family and their traditions with Reggie and Otto. And haven't you noticed that Reggie and Otto's skin is a lot darker than Ray's? So could this conspiracy actually be true? Now before we get into this, do you want to feel super old? Rocket Power turned 15 years old this year. 15! Insane! Okay, well to start figuring out this conspiracy, let's look at the third Rocket Power made-for-TV movie, Island of Menehune. This will explain the skin color. Because Danielle Rocket is originally from Hawaii, it makes sense that she'd have fairly darker skin. So Reggie and Otto just inherited their darker skin from their mother. It has nothing to do with her having an affair with Tito. Also, we never hear the kids called Tito dad. I think Reggie and Otto are just pretty informal. So I wouldn't really consider that a hard piece of evidence. And on top of all of that, Tito shares his family heritage with everybody. With Twister, with Squid, basically anyone who listens, so... I wouldn't consider that evidence either. We can just assume that Tito's just the wise storytelling kind of guy. Sorry dudes and dudettes, but with all of this disappointing evidence, I'm gonna have to give the Rocket Power Conspiracy two squid helmets out of five. Hey guys, Sapphire here from Toon Buzz, and I've got Emily held hostage in the other room while I take over the show this week. Somebody help me! Spirited Away is Miyazaki's beautiful masterpiece about a young girl forced to work in a bathhouse. Wait, is Spirited Away about child prostitution? Ten-year-old Chihiro must work in a bathhouse in order to save her parents, 
who have been turned into pigs. This is very similar to how a lot of young girls are sold into prostitution in order to pay off their parents' debts. Back in the day, bathhouses doubled as brothels. The women that worked there were called Yuna, which is what Chihiro is referred to in the Japanese version of the film. And brothel madams were called Yubaba, which is the name of the bathhouse owner. Yubaba forces Chihiro to sign a contract that changes her name to Sen, very similar to how a lot of women change their name when entering this industry. You know how like strippers change their names to something like Candy or Sapphire. And the creepy no-face spirit? He keeps offering Chihiro money because he wants to, you know, buy her. In the end, the spell is broken when Chihiro remembers her real name, symbolizing that her innocence and sense of identity has been restored. So, is this film really a commentary on Japanese child prostitution? Alright, before you go crying about how your childhood is ruined, think about those young girls who don't have a childhood. There are a lot of articles and blogs that claim that Miyazaki himself said that the bathhouse is indeed a brothel, but it is impossible to find where this quote came from, so if somebody can find it, please send it to me. He's also been quoted with saying that he made this film simply because there just aren't a lot of films out there that 10 year old girls can relate to. He said that kids these days are insensitive to the efforts that parents make to keep them happy. So from that perspective, Chihiro's journey is really just about learning work ethic and appreciating her parents. The bathhouse could very well be a commentary on the corruption of Japanese youth. This place where you go to be cleaned and purified has now become a place of filth and greed. Chihiro was never tempted by No Face's money. The only thing she cared about was saving her friend Haku and her parents. Her purity of heart is what saved her in the end. I think we can all agree that Spirited Away is about a young girl being forced to grow up. But how she does so is still up for debate, and I think this theory makes some pretty good points. So I'm giving it 3.5 giant babies. Ah yes, there's nothing better to do in the winter time than curl up in a blanket, drink some hot cocoa, and watch a movie about a psychopathic queen who wants to kill her entire family. Is it possible that Disney's Frozen and Stanley Kubrick's The Shining could be the same movie? Now this theory proposes that Frozen and The Shining are the same movie because they have the exact same plot. This is pretty insane, but let's just look at the similarities. Elsa and Jack both have something powerful inside of them that's a danger to everyone else. When given a position of power, like Jack taking care of a remote mountain resort and Elsa taking over the country of Arendelle, they both lose control. But hey, where is Anna in all of this? Well, Anna is Elsa's Danny. They're both innocent and a little naive as to what's happening around them. And what about Olaf, our favorite snowman? Olaf is Wendy Torrance. They're both goofy sidekicks who are willing to sacrifice themselves for the Danny Anna character. So then who's Kristoff? Well, he's Dick Holleran, who Danny calls when he needs help. Just like how Anna calls Kristoff when she needs his help getting through the snow. With all of this, that leaves us with one person, Hans. Yes, Hans is actually the infamous Grady from the Overlook Hotel. While Hans didn't exactly kill his entire family, he did abandon them at a chance for getting more power. Another striking resemblance between both movies is that Danny and Anna were both physically harmed by Jack and Elsa. Elsa accidentally shot Anna with an ice blast, which caused her to hide her powers. And Jack accidentally dislocated Danny's shoulder, which caused him to give up drinking. So are Frozen and The Shining the same movie? This is so crazy and insane, it's hard to even really consider it a conspiracy. The idea that Frozen and The Shining are the same movie is really just a comparison between some slight similarities in both films. Of course, it's hilarious to compare Crazy Jack Nicholson to a Disney princess, but do I really think they're the same movie? Yeah, no way. Plus, if Elsa really was Jack, wouldn't she have become the ice statue at the end of the movie instead of Anna? Based on all of this evidence, I'm gonna have to give the Frozen and the Shining conspiracy, or the Frozening conspiracy, two axes out of five. The Toy Story trilogy seems to hold a special place in everyone's heart. 
It reminds us all of a simpler time in our lives when we had a loving and devoted relationship with our toys. It also made us question whether or not our toys had a secret sentient life, but that's besides the point. One of the most heartbreaking moments in the movie trilogy was learning about Jessie's past, how she was abandoned by her owner Emily. No relation, I swear. But folks on the internet have made this stunning connection. Could Andy's mom actually be Jessie's original owner, Emily? Now, Pixar is known for its Easter eggs in movies, but this theory states that it is absolutely canon that in the Toy Story universe, Andy's mom, Mrs. Davis, is Jessie's original owner, Emily. Well, let's look at Andy's cowboy hat from the first Toy Story movie. It looks an awful lot like Jessie's, which we don't see until Toy Story 2. Both hats are a reddish color with a white stitching around the rim. One difference being the white ribbon around Jesse's hat, which is missing from Andy's, but is instead replaced by a slightly faded circle where a ribbon could have once been. Could this have possibly belonged to Andy's mom when she was a kid? In Toy Story 2, Andy's mom mentions that Woody is an old family toy. Unlike Andy's other toys, Woody doesn't seem to know where he came from which is evident in Toy Story 2 when he discovers that he was an icon in the 50s with his own TV show and whole line of merchandise. He doesn't even know that he has partners like Jesse and Bullseye and the Prospector. Now, I'm not going to break your heart by retelling Jesse's backstory. I'll let Sarah McLaughlin do that. But her owner, Emily, grew up with Jesse very similar to how Andy grew up with Woody. Jesse and Emily were very close, but eventually Emily grew up and gave Jesse away. But let's look back at that montage from Toy Story 2. We see a hat on Emily's bed that's very similar to Andy's hat at the beginning of Toy Story. Also, clues in that montage show that Jesse was with Emily somewhere between the 60s and the 70s. We also never see Emily's face. We only see a quick shot of her hair when she's a teenager, which is a short auburnish color. Compare that to Andy's mom's hair, which arguably changes a lot throughout the trilogy. But as time goes on, we can assume that it lightens or that she dyes it. Let's recap what we have so far. We don't know Andy's mom's first name, and we also don't know Emily's last name. The hats are very similar. Based on clues of a time period in the montage, Emily would be old enough to be Andy's mom. So could Andy's mom really be the original owner of Jesse? It's hard to believe that the mother of Andy, a boy who loves his toys so much, would so easily give away her favorite toy as a child. Of course, Andy does seem to forget Woody and his other toys as he gets older, but he looks at them so fondly before he decides to donate them in Toy Story 3. And at the beginning, he even decides to keep Woody and bring him to college with him. Also, Andy's mom seems to have no reaction when he sees Andy's new Jesse toy in Toy Story 2. Whether it was the same Jesse doll or not, wouldn't his mom have some sort of memory of the toy she was so attached to as a child? And Jessie has some pretty vivid memories of Emily, and yet shows no recognition of Andy's mom. So while these are rather arbitrary, let's actually look at some real facts. Toy Story 2 was actually never intended to be made. Pixar didn't anticipate being able to make a sequel when the first Toy Story came out. So because they made the first film with no intention of making a second film at all, they probably modeled Andy's hat with no running story behind it. In fact, that hat was modeled for Andy before the Jesse model was even created. At the time Toy Story 2 was being made, 3D computer animation was still very new and very expensive. It's likely that Pixar just wanted to use the same or a very similar 3D model to save time and money for the sequel. Even more evidence proving this theory unlikely. According to the Art of Toy Story book, Andy's mom's name is Jennifer Davis. The book apparently shows a copy of an early recording script where Andy's mom is referred to as Jennifer Davis. Unfortunately, we couldn't find a picture of this, so you guys will just have to believe me. Andy's hat has a pointed crown, whereas Jesse's is completely round. The only real similarities between the two hats is the color and the white stitching around the rim. Pixar is definitely known for their Easter eggs, but Jesse's abandonment is a huge emotional factor in Toy Story 2's plot. If Pixar had really intended for Andy's mom to be Emily, wouldn't they have made it a much bigger deal? I love the idea of a connection between Jesse and Andy's mom. But I also like to believe that the entire Davis family loves their toys unconditionally and would never abandon them. So on the plausibility meter, I'm going to give the Andy's mom conspiracy two and a half snakes in my boot out of five. The newest My Little Pony show, Friendship is Magic, is adored by hundreds of little girls. And
and thousands of middle-aged men. So you can see why this has been one of our most requested episodes. This theory seems to have taken the entire brony fandom by storm, and it originates from one creepypasta forum. And honestly, it's hard to believe I'm about to say this about a show starring magical pony friends, but are the characters from My Little Pony Friendship is Magic inspired by the deaths of these real-life girls from North Carolina? First off, this conspiracy relies solely on the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic series that aired in 2010. The show centers around six anthropomorphic pony friends called the Main Six, and together they go on adventures and learn about the magic of friendship. This new series is inspired by the original line of Hasbro toys, as well as the two original My Little Pony series, the one from the 1980s, My Little Pony, and the one from the 90s, My Little Pony Tales. But plot-wise, Friendship is Magic has no relation to its previous two shows. In fact, the characters from the 80s and the 90s shows are entirely different than those in Friendship is Magic. So then where does this conspiracy come from? Well, it seems to stem from a news story about six girls who all went to high school together in North Carolina and all died on the same day, January 18, 1989. Supposedly, the creator of Friendship is Magic, Lauren Faust, was inspired by the story and based the six main characters of her show off of the six girls from North Carolina. And just a warning, what you're about to hear is really sad. The alleged news story goes as follows. The first girl in the story, Samantha Gales, inspired Fluttershy. The second girl was Janice Walters, who was the inspiration for Rarity. Alexander Matthews, who like Rainbow Dash, was athletic and competitive. Jamie Sanders was a farm girl, who was the inspiration for Applejack. Pinkie Pie was inspired by Katherine Jackson, who went into foster care after her father killed both himself and her mother. And finally, Twilight Sparkle was inspired by Cynthia Little. In Friendship is Magic, each member of the main six has a life these girls from North Carolina would have dreamed of. Rainbow Dash is a great athlete, Applejack has a successful farm, Pinkie Pie is happy. So is there really a connection between My Little Pony and the tragic deaths of these six girls from North Carolina? The actual news article about these six girls from North Carolina who all went to the same high school, who all died on the same day, is actually impossible to find. The author of the original conspiracy on Creepypasta stated that his friend saved him this news article from an unnamed newspaper in 1989. And when he started to watch My Little Pony, he made the connection between these six girls from the article and the six main characters from the show. But this particular article, nor this news story, is nowhere to be found. All of this evidence comes from the original author's conspiracy. And you would think the strange happenstance of six girls from the same high school all dying on the same day in the same town would make major news headlines. However, if you've somehow stooped us and found the actual news article, please send it to us. But anyway, all of this is not good enough for us here at Cartoon Conspiracy. So we decided to dig a little deeper. According to actual North Carolina death records, some of these girls actually existed, but not as the conspiracy suggests. There are a lot of Katherine Jacksons in North Carolina, but there is one who died in 1998, which is the closest case to the alleged girl in the conspiracy. There were also a lot of Cynthia Littles, but there is one who died in 2001, which is still also the closest case to the alleged girl in the conspiracy. And according to our research, there is absolutely no records of a Samantha Gales or a Jamie Walters ever living or of ever dying in North Carolina. So, if our research is correct, none of them died even close to each other, and they weren't even close to being in the same high school. In an interview, Lauren Faust said that her inspiration for Rarity was actually Audrey Hepburn. And on her Twitter, she actually shared pictures of her childhood My Little Pony toys that were the actual inspiration for the characters in Friendship is Magic. When she pitched the show, Lauren said she wanted to create something that contradicted the idealized stereotypes of girls. Her purpose for creating Friendship is Magic was to create a show for girls that they could relate to, but challenge the stereotypical girly girl, goody two-shoes female characters in other children's shows. Not to honor the fictional death of six girls who died over 25 years ago. Aside from this conspiracy being incredibly sad, it also makes very little sense, and there's not much actual evidence. And personally, I prefer rainbows and sparkles and friendships over, you know, death. So on the plausibility meter, I give the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic Conspiracy one spike out of five.
How many of you guys out there are dog lovers? Personally, I love dogs. They're fuzzy, they're loyal, they smell weird, they can learn tricks, and they can even write. Wait. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at one of the most popular cartoons on TV right now. As all of you diehard Family Guy fans know, Brian Griffin, the dog, is an aspiring writer. This poetic pooch has published two books, but also maybe a TV series. What if Brian is actually the writer of the series Family Guy, a show about his experiences living with the Griffins. Okay, I know what you're all thinking. Brian? Family Guy is a cartoon. Brian isn't even real. Which, okay, yeah, that's all true. But what if we're watching events that have transpired in the show and then filtered through Brian's perspective? That would explain why he always serves as the straight, man-esque voice of the show. Oh, it's freezing out here. We never should have left Quahog. If this theory is correct, that means we're watching a show in a show that is created by a character in the show. Whoa, I'm feeling like there's Inception levels of levels going on here. And this idea does support the heavy quantity of episodes that feature just Brian and Stewie. Of course, the events that Brian has experienced firsthand would be the easiest for him to recount. The idea of Brian writing the show would explain why Stewie starts off the series as an evil maniac but has gradually been transitioning towards a greater good. Because it is pretty common for dogs to act up or become resentful when a new baby is brought into the house. Also, the show is known for its frequent breaking of the fourth wall. Hi, I'm Stewie Griffin. In the episode Farmer Guy, Peter actually mentions that Fox arranges their crazy antics in advance. This reference to the network could point to greater behind-the-scenes happenings. Maybe Peter's remark can be taken literally, and Fox really does pay for the show within a show that Brian writes. So, is Family Guy really a meta show within a show written by a talking dog? This theory seems pretty solid, but if Brian really is the writer of the show, why would he so often portray himself in such a negative light? Fans of the show are quick to point out that Brian is rather a self-deprecating character, so it makes sense. It's clear from the series that Brian is pretty pretentious, and the humor in Family Guy doesn't seem like something he would really write. But who knows, maybe you can teach an old dog new tricks. And in the episode Peter Problems, Brian said, I have a job, I'm a writer, I'm working right now. This is the raw material of a picture of life I'm going to paint with words. This quote really does make it seem like this theory could be possible. I mean, he could have literally gone on to paint a picture of words of his life in a semi-autobiographical style, which is the show Family Guy. But a major flaw in this theory is time paradoxes. Also note, this is your spoiler warning. The most obvious and relevant instance of time shenanigans that tear a huge hole in this theory is when Brian died. Okay, fine. He came back to life and sometimes he hangs out at the clam. But Vinny, his temporary replacement, appears throughout the series. When Stewie goes back in time to save Brian, it nixes the family ever having to get Vinny. No one would remember him, so no one could tell Brian about him. Brian wouldn't even know he died. Then again, the whole art could have been something Brian cooked up completely on his own. How you coming on that novel you working on? Huh? As I mentioned, if it is a TV show, not everything is going to appear exactly how it happens in real life. It makes sense for him to throw in some original, crazy stories just to get those ratings up. There's a lot going on with this theory, but honestly, it feels like it's mostly speculation. That being said, I can't say it's not entirely unbelievable. In fact, it actually would be totally awesome if this turned out to be true. It's hard to flat out disprove this, so I'm going to give the Family Guy Conspiracy three and a half copies of Wish It Won It Do It S out of five. Today on Cartoon Conspiracy, we're going to bend the rules a little bit. Now, as you might have already gathered, the subject we're discussing today isn't necessarily a cartoon. But, for my own defense, he technically did have his own animated series. However, naturally, that is not what we're going to be talking about today. Instead, we're going to be talking about one of the most iconic animated characters of all time, Mario. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Mario, the Italian mustache mascot of Nintendo. You've probably helped him save princesses, race go-karts, referee boxing matches, and even golf like a pro. Mario and his friends have appeared in over 200 games since 1981. But what if the Mario universe isn't just all a game? What if he and his friends are all just actors, and the games we're playing are really just stage plays? 
conspiracy stems from the ever-popular fan theory that Super Mario Bros. 3 is all just a stage play. The evidence goes as follows. When you begin Super Mario 3, a curtain rises and the characters enter the screen, like actors entering a stage. Even the blocks you encounter have bolts on them, like they're attached to a backdrop. And if you look closely, they even cast shadows, even though there's nothing behind them. Also, the platforms in Super Mario 3 aren't floating like they are in other Mario games. They're either on top of pillars or they're suspended by ropes, like stage pieces. Oh, and when you complete a level, Mario exits stage right. This is also the first game where Mario dresses up like different animals, like he's literally playing different characters. Okay, so why would Mario, an Italian plumber, want to perform in a play about his own adventures? Well, the theory argues that since the first Mario Brothers game follows the Rescue the Kidnapped Princess plot, and Super Mario Brothers 2 was all just a dream, instead of returning to a life of fixing toilets after he rescues the princess in the first game, Mario instead decides to create a play where he can reenact his adventures. Well, now that we know that weird and sad story, let's move on to the even bigger theory, that the whole Mario gang is a troupe of actors and all of their games are really just stage plays. Now, hear me out, diehard Nintendo nerds, because this theory actually kind of explains a lot. Like, why would Mario and Luigi be at each other's throats in Mario Kart and Mario Party, but then be partners in crime in other games? And why would Bowser be a good guy in Super Mario RPG, but then go on to capture Princess Peach in the Super Mario Brother games? These guys either have very fickle morals, or they're all just very good actors with a wide range of characters to play. Honestly, this is a solid explanation for the lack of continuity throughout all of the Mario games. Well, the game levels in Super Mario 64 and Super Mario Sunshine are called episodes, and are presented just like episodes of a Japanese TV show. And you can even see a flying camera crew in Mario 64 and in Mario Kart. So is all the world a stage for Mario and his friends? As crazy as this theory sounds, it's actually pretty widely accepted among the Nintendo fandom. The Super Mario games and their spin-offs are pretty all over the place when it comes to continuity, so the actors in a play conspiracy actually does provide a solid explanation. In fact, creator of Mario Shigeru Miyamoto actually said, I look at our characters in a similar way and feel that they can play different roles in different games. It's more like they're one big family, or maybe a troupe of actors. So while this doesn't literally prove that Mario and his friends are actually actors or that Super Mario Bros. 3 is actually supposed to be a play, it does give us some really solid context. So on the plausibility meter, I give the Mario Conspiracy 4.5 Koopas out of 5. The 90s were a time for ripped jeans, skateboards, and everything being totally tubular. Throw some ducks into the mix and you've got the makings of the Disney Afternoon lineup. For all of you 90s kids out there, these names will probably ring a bell. Quack Pack, Duck Tales, and the terror that flaps in the night, Darkwing Duck. And if you were not fortunate enough to watch these shows, here's a brief explanation. These three shows follow the adventures of secondary characters from the cast of the original Mickey Mouse cartoons. Each show centers around a cast of quirky, or should I say, quacky, Characters all embarking on unique adventures, like being a superhero in disguise, or a grumpy billionaire. But there could be something else these shows have in common besides their friendly, feathered main characters. Is it possible that DuckTales, Quack Pack, and Darkwing Duck all took place in the same universe? The whole theory starts with DuckTales. <laughs> DuckTales follows the adventures of billionaire Scrooge McDuck and his three grandsons Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and sometimes Webby, Scrooge's housemaid's niece. Through their crazy adventures, they encounter several villains that try to steal Scrooge's fortune, but of course, Scrooge and the boys always prevail. According to the conspiracy, after the events of DuckTales, Scrooge dies of old age. Since Scrooge was gone, the boys had to go live with their uncle Donald, and that's how we get Quack Pack, which is a series with an almost identical structure, but instead of Huey, Dewey, and Louie gallivanting around with Scrooge and his billions, they join Donald Duck, a camera operator, to his news reporting girlfriend on their travels around the world. And as if Quack Pack takes place years after the events of DuckTales, and on the same timeline, Huey, Dewey, and Louie are all teenagers now. So if DuckTales and Quack Pack are supposed to be basically the same show, what happened to Webby? She was a major character in DuckTales and went on most, if not all, of the adventures with the boys. So wouldn't she also be in Quack Pack if that were the case? Take a moment to remember that Webby wasn't related to Scrooge by blood. 
Her guardian was the maid, Bettina, so after Scrooge died, she most likely went to go live with her. So now, what about Darkwing Duck? A show about the adventures of a mask-wearing, web-footed superhero whose alter ego is suburban father, Drake Mallard. Well, if you can recall, Launchpad McQuack was Scrooge's trusted pilot in DuckTales. So if the events of this conspiracy are true, after Scrooge's death, Launchpad would have to find a new job. So Launchpad offered to be Darkwing Duck's sidekick and pilot to his plane, the Thunderquack. And how could we forget the reoccurring characters that cross over from show to show? This really does add some ground to this theory. In the Darkwing Duck episode, In Like Blunt, we get a cameo appearance from the Beagle Boys, Flynnhard Blomgold, and Magic of the Spell, all of Scrooge's arch enemies from DuckTales. And in DuckTales, we see Ludwig von Drake, Donald Duck's uncle, who we learn is actually a close friend of Launchpad McQuack. Von Drake then becomes Donald's resident inventor in Quack Pack. From all of this, clear connections can be drawn between characters that tie all three of these shows together. And is it really a coincidence that two of the cities in both of these shows are named from duck puns? Duckburg and St. Canard feel like they could really exist in the same universe. Now, does this foul theory hold up, or can we quack the case? Well, this theory is so incredibly plausible, it quacks me up. But there are some things that might keep it from being true. When Darkwing Duck was originally developed, it was intended to be a spin-off series of DuckTales. The idea of Darkwing Duck was inspired by two episodes of DuckTales, Double O Duck and The Masked Mallard. In Double O Duck, Launchpad becomes a secret agent, and in The Masked Mallard, Scrooge becomes a masked vigilante superhero, wearing a purple uniform and cape. Apparently, there were plans to have Launchpad and Scrooge McDuck be a crime-fighting duo, but due to having no heart, the show idea was scrapped. And from there, writer Tad Stones went on to develop Darkwing Duck. Which means that maybe residually, all the crossovers and cameos are just coincidence. Another thing to note is that in Quack Pack, the characters are shown interacting with humans, while DuckTales and Darkwing Duck exclusively feature anthropomorphized animals. We could propose that somewhere along the line, ducks took over the human world. But wouldn't we have still seen humans in DuckTales before we see them in Quack Pack? This theory is well thought out, and who knows, maybe in this universe, humans are only found in certain geographical areas. Well, this conspiracy isn't quite all it's quacked up to be, but it still builds a solid nest. Honestly, I'm still pretty convinced of the theory, despite the few gray areas we brought up. And I do have a soft spot for Disney afternoons. So on the plausibility meter, I'm going to give the Quackvasion conspiracy three duck blurs out of five. It's no secret that I am a cartoon fanatic, but I am also a Walt Disney aficionado. Seriously, I've read every book ever published about him. I've seen every documentary. I even go to Disneyland at least once a week. I don't want to brag or anything, but I probably know everything there is to know about Walter Elias Disney. So it's not unknown that this American legend has a pretty long list of crazy conspiracies about him like the whereabouts of his maybe frozen body parts and his ties to, like, say, the Illuminati. But this particular conspiracy we're going to cover today actually took me by surprise. Could Walt Disney actually be an FBI informant? Okay, Walt Disney, a secret agent for a government organization? Can you imagine comparing Walt Disney to, say, James Bond or even Burt Macklin? Well, this conspiracy proposes that Walt Disney was collecting information and reporting it back to the FBI. And the information could be about any of the famous and powerful people Disney was on good terms with all over the world. But how could Walt Disney, the pioneer of American animation, a man who preached in believing in your dreams, how could he be secretly spying for the FBI? Well, in 1994, Mark Elliott published a book called Walt Disney, Hollywood's Dark Prince. It explored the darker side of this esteemed creator and made some pretty wild accusations. But one point in particular Elliott made caught a good deal of attention. It is, of course, the theory we are currently exploring. The author declared that from 1940 to his death in 1966, Walt Disney worked alongside the FBI as a secret informer. And, Believe it or not, there are actually FBI documents to back this up. Some of these documents can be found on the FBI website under his full name, Walter Elias Disney. 
There are over 570 pages, but the majority of them have been redacted, which of course Elliot claims to be suspicious. He believes that the Disney family, along with the FBI, could be hiding something from us. Of the pages that are still left, we've learned that Walt volunteered his park, Disneyland, for the FBI to use however they find necessary, and that that relationship was mutually beneficial. And there is also a proposal for the FBI to provide their offices to Disney to shoot portions of the Mickey Mouse Club. Now remember, this was post-World War II in the US, so one of the major activities of the FBI was combating communist threats. It's actually well documented that Walt Disney was staunchly against communism and did whatever he could to oppose it. Around this time, the second Red Scare was in its peak. And Senator Joseph McCarthy had instilled a fear of communists hiding amongst us and encouraged people to turn in those they were suspicious of. This fear created the Hollywood blacklist. Many creative professionals were forced out of Hollywood because of their political beliefs or rumors about their political leanings. It is known that at this time, Walt Disney did actually assist the FBI in its investigations with communist threats in Hollywood. In October 1947, Disney did testify in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee, a committee that investigated alleged instances of communism in the United States, after the Hollywood Reporter released a list of communist sympathizers in the film industry. Celebrities like Walt Disney and Ronald Reagan opened up the hearing by saying that the communist threat in Hollywood was a big one. Disney specifically testified about the employee strike at the animation studio after his resistance to join a union, which at the time was considered to be a red flag. So, was Walt Disney really an FBI informant? With so many of the official FBI documents redacted, it really brings up a lot of questions about this conspiracy. Mark Elliott's book does take a strong negative bias towards Walt Disney and makes some pretty extreme accusations, like that Walt Disney's body was actually cryogenically frozen. Oh, and that Walt was actually born in 1890 to a peasant woman in Spain. In fact, after the book's release, Walt's family made an official statement that denied the claims Elliott made in his book. They acknowledged that Walt was designated as a contact for the FBI, but his late wife Lillian Disney went on to say, There's no evidence in the records that would even support or tend to suggest that Mr. Disney even knew of this designation. Along with this, former director of the FBI, William H. Webster, went on to say, Such records do not support the assertion by Elliott that Walt Disney was an informant for the FBI. And according to the documents still available on the FBI website, the FBI denied every single proposal Walt gave them to film the Mickey Mouse Club at the FBI headquarters. As for his strong anti-communism, we have to understand that post-World War II was a very different time in America. People really thought that Russian communists might drop nuclear bombs on us at any second. So the threat of communist spies in America was perceived as very real. Everybody was spying on everybody. Paranoia was very high, and the influence of McCarthyism was so strong that neighbors were spying on neighbors and wives were telling on husbands. Walt Disney was probably just doing his best to do what seemed to be the most patriotic thing at that time. I think it could be possible that he, like so many people in America at that time, was acting almost like an informant just out of patriotism for our country. Walt Disney is still a beloved figure all around the world, but he's definitely not flawless. It's possible that he signed up with the FBI to inform, but never actually did anything. So while he may not have been perfect, Walt Disney has still made an enormous impact on the world with his innovations. Not necessarily his supposed secret spying for the government. It's a little hard to give this conspiracy a rating because it's a little true, but a little not true. But since it's the spirit of the show, I guess I'm gonna have to give the Walt Disney FBI informant conspiracy two and a half cryogenically frozen Walt Disney heads out of five. It's halfway, seems fair. Yep. Texas is known for its big food, big hats, George Bush, and for being home to our favorite redneck family, The Hills, from the popular show, King of the Hill. But it could also be home to some baby daddy drama. Is it possible that Hank Hill isn't actually Bobby's real father? If you're not familiar with King of the Hill, let me give you a little background on the show. 
King of the Hill was an adult animated show that aired from 1997 to 2010. It follows the life of propane salesman Hank Hill as he tries to handle the daily ordeals of living in Texas with his family. Some of Hank's best friends are exterminator Dale Gribble, mumbling Boom Hauer, and his loser next door neighbor Bill Dotrieve. Now that you're all caught up, let's get into this. The theory we're covering today stems from the episode To Sirloin With Love in which we learn that Hank and Peggy are having trouble conceiving due to Hank's fertility issues. The birth of their son Bobby is explained almost like a miracle. With Hank's single viable sperm managing to make it through. However, some conspirators are skeptical about this and postulate that Hank is outright sterile. These conspirators believe that Bill Dotrieve, Hank's neighbor, is actually Bobby's biological father. Hailing their proof from the episode, Hank's on board, in which Bill confesses to Hank that in a moment of weakness on a dark rainy night, he slept with Peggy. After Bill confesses, Hank immediately shuts him down by saying, No, you didn't, Bill. I know. This makes it seem like Bill and Hank are all too aware that Bill sleeping with Peggy is just something he wished had happened. But who knows, maybe he agreed to cover up something he realized he probably shouldn't have admitted to. It's also not hard to believe that Bill would sleep with Peggy. He constantly professes his attraction to her, considering her the epitome of a desirable woman. His never dying crush on her is sort of a running gag in the show. However, this is where it gets a little interesting. Most fans of the show would find it hard to find a reason or even evidence of the reverse. Like, why would Peggy ever sleep with Bill? But supporters of this theory point out that in the episode Luann Virgin 2.0, Peggy admitted that she had premarital sex with another man prior to Hank. And you can probably assume the conclusion that these conspirators jumped to. Oh, and one last thing. Bill shares his top secret family recipe with Bobby in order to keep the family tradition alive. So why would he do that if Bobby wasn't in his family? Could Bill Dotrieve really be Bobby's biological father? I don't know about you guys, but I definitely have a lot of questions. If Hank is actually 100% diagnosably sterile, where does he really think Bobby came from? And as for Bill stating that he had a moment of weakness with Peggy, the remainder of dialogue with Hank in that scene seems to really point to that being a lie. Likewise, the man that Peggy was having premarital sex with was revealed to be Wayne Trotter, who was questioning his sexuality. Wayne Trotter is not Bill. That we know for sure. On top of this, we know that Bill has feelings for Peggy, but throughout the show, she constantly reminds him that she finds him absolutely repulsive. Some do say that Bobby looks a lot like Bill, but Bobby also looks a lot like Hank's dad and Hank's brother, Good Hank. And finally, in the flashback episode, How to Fire a Rifle Without Really Trying, we see Hank as a kid shooting cans with his father, and he happens to look a lot like Bobby. I think the theory brings up a good argument, and while I still have some questions, most of the evidence seems to be wishful thinking on Bill's part. So on the plausibility meter, I'm going to give the King of the Hill conspiracy two propane and propane accessories out of five. Ugh, I hate Mondays. And you know who else hates Mondays? Our favorite fat, orange, and lasagna-loving cat, Garfield. Garfield is living every lazy cat's dream, sitting at home all day with his owner John and dog Odie. But wait, what if this is actually just Garfield living a dream? What if his house, his owner, and everything else in Garfield's life is just a figment of his imagination? The first Garfield comic was introduced to the public in 1978. Garfield was a huge hit. He launched off the newspaper and into our hearts alongside John and Odie. However, 11 years later, a week before Halloween in 1989, newspaper readers were concerned by a strange and rather creepy Garfield comic. The comic showed Garfield wandering around an abandoned house with the for sale sign in the front yard. Unable to cope with the prospect of his happy life being false and the truth of being abandoned, he screams out, I don't want to be alone, and is magically transported back into the loving arms of his owner, John. This comic sparked controversy that the whole Garfield compendium has just been a facade imagined by a slowly starving orange cat. 
At the end of the comic, author Jim Davis leaves the reader with an eerie message. He writes, an imagination is a powerful tool. It can tint memories of the past or shade perceptions of the present or paint a future so vivid that it can entice or terrify, all depending on how we conduct ourselves today. Uh, okay. Fans of this conspiracy believe that Davis must have been inspired by an Italian short called Valse Triste. It's from the 1967 Italian film Allegro Non Troppo, made to copy Disney's Fantasia. The short in question follows the story of a cat wandering around the destroyed remains of his abandoned home while seeing visions of his family and a wonderful past life. Until it was revealed to the audience that the cat was in fact a ghost the whole time. Sounds very familiar, don't you think? So is this feline that we've fallen in love with really just imagining everything due to his life of desolation? When you consider the Italian cartoon, everything does make more sense if you assume that Garfield has been imagining his whole life. Now I've gotten along with cats, but I've never been able to understand them the way John does. People speculate that the reason John understands Garfield so well is that he's reacting to his body language and facial expressions. But there's really not much variation in Garfield's faces. But if John really is a figment of Garfield's imagination, of course he's going to know what's going on in Garfield's head. Kevin Skinner was mindlessly scouring the internet when he came upon this particular theory. And coincidentally, Kevin actually had a business meeting scheduled with Jim Davis later in that week. When Kevin went in, he knew he had to tell Davis about what he had found. The story goes that when he confronted him with this theory, Jim Davis just laughed about it. In the Garfield 20th Anniversary Collection, Davis actually goes into greater depth of how this script came to be. It says that during a writing session for Halloween week, he got the idea for a decidedly different series of strips. He wanted to scare people, and what do people fear most? Davis said, being alone. Davis was also quoted saying that this strip was not inspired by some cartoon. This refutes the idea that Davis was basing the idea for the strip off of Valse Triste, which admittedly makes it harder to draw the conclusion that Garfield's fate parallels the cat in the cartoon. It shifts their similarities more towards coincidence. And as for John's clear understanding of Garfield, it's a cartoon, people. Garfield takes place in a fictional world where cats can eat like an infinite amount of donuts and not get diabetes. So based on all this evidence, I'm gonna have to give the Garfield conspiracy one lasagna out of five.